for you today and um, so it's well done for just getting here um but yeah just to uh, say uh, hi and uh, it's fantastic to see the task force kind of moving on into this thematic this miscellaneous thematic here and i'm going to pass over to nick harry hannah and james to kind of take it on from there i don't know who wants to Thank you, Ian, for the introduction. Um, so firstly, just to echo Ian's words, a very warm welcome and thank you very much for coming. Um, we do appreciate that you're all giving up your own valuable time, so we'd like to thank you at the start just for, for attending and engaging in this process. Um, just as a, a bit of a, an introduction, this is the sixth hearing of the, the Net Zero Task Force. Um, we've previously held hearings over the past two weeks um, that have covered four specific thematic areas. Um, we've had two hearings on food, land and sea, one on the built environment, one on mobility, so covering transportation options, and, and one on energy and waste. Um, so this, this forms the sixth hearing, and here we're really looking at um, capturing cross-cutting themes, and, and we've got specific expertise around the table, which we'll come on to. Um, I think just in terms of housekeeping before we get going, um, I believe there's no fire alarms planned today. No fire alarms planned today, so if there is a fire alarm, we will head out the door and assemble outside. Um, so just as a way of an introduction to those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with the process, um, the Devon Climate Emergency Response Group has been formed by Devon County Council and a number of other stakeholders um, to coordinate a collaborative Devon-wide response to the climate emergency um, with the key objective of facilitating a reduction in carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 at the very latest. Um, and preparing Devon for the necessary adaptations to, ad adaptations to its infrastructure and services that it will need to cope in a 1.5 degree warmer world. Um, as part of that, it has appointed the Net Zero Task Force, of which five of us, six of us in the ta around the table are, are members. Um, and we've been given a remit by the Climate Emergency Response Group to use our knowledge and experience to produce an evidence-led Devon Carbon Plan. Um, for context, we're current, there are three key phases to that work. Um, we're currently in the first phase, which is the evidence gathering phase, in which you're all giving up your time graciously to contribute to today. Um, that started with a call for evidence on the 23rd of October. That will run through until January 2020, where it will close. Um, evidence that was submitted up until the 10th of November we, will be considered as part of this hearing and has been considered as part of previous hearings as well. Um, we are on at the moment we are evaluating that evidence and we're using the thematic hearings in order to help us dig deeper into the actions that are required. That will be followed by a second phase, which is the citizens' assemblies. Um, we'll base those on the evidence gathering um, that the, the task force has undertaken. 
um, and they, those assemblies will comprise a representative sample of Devon's population, its citizens, and will provide an opportunity for them to develop informed opinions and collectively discuss and review policy recommendations for how we decarbonise Devon. Following that, um, phase three, our role as the task force will move on to reviewing all the evidence and contributions and will develop a draft carbon plan that will provide credible recommendations and solutions to achieve net zero by 2050 at the very latest. Before we go on to the session today, um, I do have to read out a privacy statement from Devon County Council. Um, you will have all noticed there is a camera at the end having a, a look at us. Um, hopefully you've all been provided with a form on the way in. Um, in terms of the privacy statement, um, I'd just like to say that on behalf of the Devon Climate Emergency Response Group, Devon County Council will act as a data controller for any personal data that you provide to us. Specifically, that is images and video collected today. As such, Devon County Council will ensure that the data you give us is processed in line with our organisation's data protection policies and in line with your rights under the Data Protection Act of 2018 and the European Union General Data Protection Regulations, or GDPR. More information on this is available on the uh, privacy notice, which you should all have a copy of. Um, and can I ask the question now if anyone objects to being filmed as part of the hearing today? I'll take that as an affirmative no. Okay, um, so just before we get on to uh, context and actually delving into things, um, just some rules of engagement that I hope we can all stick to. Um, you'll have noticed I'm talking into a microphone, even though you can all probably hear me quite clearly anyway. Um, this is really so that those on the webcast can hear us. This is picking up the sound for those who are viewing online. So we will be passing the microphone around if you can all speak into it. Um, and we would like uh, to stick to one person speaking at a time, please. Um, and please refrain from having side conversations. Again, that's one so that people on the webcast who are watching can hear everything properly and also to show respect for others around the table. Um, the purpose of this hearing is to explore the options and solutions um, that could help contribute to a, a Devon carbon reduction strategy and this should therefore be viewed in the context of a public discussion rather than a debate. Um, and so if we just take an open mind coming into this that um, we could all be open to new ways of doing things and, and maybe viewing the world going forward. Um, and one point I think that we would like to add as the task force is we'd like um, you not to try and constrain your suggestions and ideas based on current planning policy or other frameworks that may exist. Um, those have all been developed in a non-net zero policy and if we're going to achieve net zero we will need new solutions and new ideas. Okay, um, so just moving on before I go on to introductions. Um, the five hearings to date have considered four main themes and um, spanning the key sectors um, that are key emitters. Um, so we had the food, land and sea hearings um, which covered the sectors of agriculture, forestry, fisheries and land use. Um, built environment that covered energy efficiency, lighting, heating, cooling and construction. Uh, mobility, which covered transport, that primarily focused on surface, surface transport, but also air and maritime. And then we had energy and waste hearing, um, covering heat and electricity generation, storage and supply. I think what's become very clear throughout all of these hearings is that there are a number of broad cross-cutting themes that have been identified and, and span each of these. And specifically, those are what we're here to talk about and are the focus of today. Um, so we have grouped those of you around the table into the very broad areas of finance, um, so covering procurement and investment, um, spatial planning, sort of down at the end of the table, and behaviour change. Um, and we would note that in, in, in addition to this, sort of whilst not a cross-cutting theme in its own right, we would expect that consumption will be a key thread of any of the discussion that we have today. So how we consume various services as, as citizens of Devon. Um, now, just to prime you all, uh, we will all be, uh, we'll be asking all of you at the end of the day to identify your top three actions um, to help establish a clear path to net zero for Devon. Um, and as part of that, we will probably also ask you for a single priority of those three actions. So if you can bear that in mind as we are going through the discussion today, that would be um, appreciated. Um, we note that three hours is a limited amount of time. Um, so we hope to give everyone who is attending a fair chance to have your say and present your views. If you don't feel that you have managed to convey everything that you want to today, um, then I would just note that the evidence portal will remain open until through January 2020. Um, so you will have the chance to submit further evidence at www.devonclimateemergency.org.uk. 
Okay, I think that's probably enough from me now. You're probably tired of hearing me speak. Um, so what I'd like to do is introduce my co-chairs for the day. Um, I'll start with Hannah. Morning, everybody. My name's Hannah Laurie, and I'm an Associate Director at Ricardo Energy and Environment, and I specialise in resource efficiency and waste management. Um, so, and I'm also the Southwest Chair of the Chartered Institute of Waste Management currently. Um, so in terms of this sort of cross-cutting themes, hearing the area, the area of expertise for me really is from the procurement perspective. So having worked in procurement for the last 15 years, procuring primarily um, waste infrastructure and services, but particularly now with the move towards more sort of sustainable procurement and particularly focusing on bringing more environmental and social aspects into the procurement processes that we follow in, in the public sector. So I just wanted to set the scene a little bit about some of those cross-cutting themes that I'm going to be joining with the debate later, so on public procurement, but also on the finance side, and just to pick up some of the things that have come out of the previous hearings. So on the public procurement side, some of the very broad cross-cutting themes that have come out, I think probably of all of them so far, has been the role of public procurement to support local supply chains, um, such as food, such as renewable energy, and to support those to, to grow within Devon. Um, it's about promoting social and environmental value in, in large institutions through procurement processes, and promoting innovation and sustainability through those processes as well. Uh, the role of the public sector in purchasing energy from renewables, um, even if that means paying a small premium to do so, but to encouraging that, that behaviour and to be leading the way, really, on prioritising carbon by, by demonstrating or leading, really, from the front, really, there, from the public sector perspective. On the finance side, um, there's quite a lot of detail there, and we'll, we'll get into that in more discussion when we do the breakout session. But just as a high level, some of the cross-cutting themes that have come up in a number of the hearings, so the role of incentives and subsidies, and whether those subsidies are in the right place, and the need for those to perhaps cover areas that they don't currently do so. So things like, can we provide subsidies uh, to help improve soil condition, uh, to reward wetlands and trees and landscape, for example, to recover landfill gas in the waste sector, or promote energy from waste to use carbon capture technologies. Those are some of the things that have come out of the previous hearings. Um, then as well, looking at discounts potentially to, to help on the, on the finance side. So can discounts be provided to incentivise retrofitting of uh, building efficiency and renewables? Things such as council tax discounts or business rate discounts have been discussed across the hearings. And another broad area that were covered were loans and the role of 0% or potentially very low rate loans there to, to minimise um, to provide low-cost loans for delivering some of the energy efficiency and renewables improvements that will be required to decarbonise uh, Devon. And the public sector's involvement in providing those loans to, to help with that. Uh, and then levies. Can we use levies to um, de-incentivise de um, polluting activities and to incentivise those that would contribute towards decarbonisation? And then finally, the use of pricing to try and encourage behaviour change. So that's just a summary, really, of a very high level of, of some of the cross-cutting ideas that have come out of the, the previous hearings. Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is James Shorten. I'm a geographer and a planner. I've worked in local authorities, academia, uh, large multidisciplinary consultancies, and I now uh, run a planning and environmental consultancy called GEO in Totnes. Um, my role on the task force is to cover spatial planning, and my background um, is in really assessing the role of the planning system at big scale on the strategic level, but then also I'm a, a rural specialist, and I've looked into things like settlement strategy quite a lot in terms of the outcomes that produces. Uh, and I'm the author of the One Planet Development Practice Guidance for the Welsh Government, which is a very innovative planning policy which um, allows people to live on the land when they can show they have a less than one planet footprint. And it's been a success. Um, the built environment session also strayed very often into planning, as you wouldn't be expected to hear. 
And I think the most important things for us to look at today in terms of spatial planning and, and strategy are, are four. It's first the role of the planning system, but also broader um, things principally under the control of local authorities to influence the spatial pattern of activity and new development, which are effectively a systems issue, which then knocks on into many other carbon outcomes. So effectively, who's keeping their eye on the, the spatial picture and how that's all working is, is very important. The planning system, of course, only introduce two or three percent of new development each year, but it tries to orchestrate a wider piece. But we also talked in the built environment hearing about how therefore that two or three percent should be something quite different and quite forcing of change rather than just a, a spatial representation of business as usual. We also talked about the more holistic application of the system. The system when it was brought into being uh, from the 30s and then in the 1947 Act intended to be much more than it is now and particularly to reach towards land use in the sense of agriculture and forestry and so on and coordinate that in relation to built environment uh, and we gradually weeded that out of the system but there is perhaps imperative to start reconnecting all those functions of spatial planning. And the, the final one we talked about was speed. Typically it takes eight to ten years to produce a new local plan. We just don't have that much time. So are there ways in which to kind of, I don't mean the term bypass in a bad way, but find faster ways of achieving uh, routes to new spatial policy to, to respond to the emergency we have? Because um, an emergency response isn't a ten year response, it's too slow. So that's the context of the issues I'm interested in. Okay. Harry. Um, hi everyone, uh, so my name's Harry Bonnell. I work for a charity called Devon Communities Together. Um, I'm primarily on the task force to draw upon the uh, 60 years of experience that um, Devon Communities Together has of working with rural communities and to um, represent the many issues that cross all areas of um, the debate or the discussion. Um, I have experience working uh, in many forms of community consultation, uh, including on neighbourhood plans and some familiarity with um, what that entails. Um, I have experience of working with social entrepreneurs and um, different community groups uh, and the um, process that social entrepreneurs and procurement often have to take with um, engagement uh, of commissioners and different areas through that. Um, and I hold a um, master's degree in engaging on the sustainability challenge through uh, a systems thinking approach. Um, regarding behaviour change, um, today we're aware that sort of 62% of the changes recommended by the climate um, change report is uh, related to behaviour change, um, so it's a massive area. Um, I'm particularly interested in areas of cooperation um, and the cooperation that's going to be needed across different sectors from the public, um, business and uh, community and um, government sectors. And I'm interested to hear people's views on how to foster collaboration and build trust through things such as small immediate um, wins to show the um, emergency urgency of um, actions that are being taken. Um, and yeah, looking forward to everyone's discussion today. Thank you. Um, and, and just finally, by way of introduction for myself, um, you've all heard me talk enough, so I'll be very brief. Um, I'm Nick Boyer. I am the chair of the Chartered Institution of Highways and Transportation for the Southwest region. Um, I am a transport planner by trade, chartered transport planner working at AECOM. Um, my role has really therefore been concentrated around mobility and how we can ensure rapid decarbonisation in the transport sector. Um, and I think all of the cross-cutting themes that we're looking at touching on today um, have, have a role to play in that. So spatial planning, for instance, in terms of how we can build better and ensure better developments that reduce the need to travel in the first place. Um, and where we can't reduce the need to travel, provide sustainable travel connections first. Um, it's effectively ensuring places for people, walking and cycling. Um, Behaviour change, how do we actually get people to travel on other modes? Um, the automobile industry has been very good at selling the idea that everyone needs a car. Everyone should travel by car and it is a lifestyle choice. How do we make an attractive lifestyle choice actually travelling by other modes that are more sustainable and more active? Um, and I think there's a really interesting challenge around that. Um, 
and, and then on finance as well, um, Hannah mentioned about levies relating to the energy and waste sector. Um, I think they're going to be quite key in the transportation sector as well. So can we do something to introduce levies to disincentivise travel by the more polluting vehicles? That could take the form of a diesel ban, for instance, clean air zones, congestion charging. Could we penalise frequent flyers? Um, we have a large airport in the region, Exeter Airport, just under a million passengers a year. Um, but also, away from the disincentives, how can we incentivise people to use public transport and more sustainable modes as well? Um, so I, I think I'll end it there. I think what we're going to do now is run around a number of introductions around the table. Um, I think Harry's going to lead on that session. Um, I think the, the great thought is that there's a number of task force members here as witnesses today who I can see, so um, it'd be great to share their expertise as well. So over to Harry. Um, we're already running um, late, as is the way of things, but um, just going to very quickly, before we get into everybody uh, giving their expertise, I think it's very important that we just go around the table and introduce ourselves. Um, considering that we're talking about behaviour change and we're rapidly understanding the scale and urgency of change that is um, needed, I thought if you could indulge me, we'd try something a little bit different um, very quickly. Um, I'm going to give you a rock. I know it sounds like a silly thing, but um, this is used uh, around the world as a talking piece idea. Um, it helps generally to uh, make people succinct um, and in their talking, which we're going to need today. going to need people to be very concise and succinct in what they do. Uh, and it also helps everyone else focus uh, on the person that is talking. So just um, I'm going to pass it around, feel it in your hand, have a look at it, uh, and then I want you to say your name where you've come from, one thing you think you can bring to the meeting today and one thing you'd like to gain from the meeting today. Um, I hope that's clear. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. This very beautiful rock has a fossil in it which situates us in a very long time period in which the hours is like a flash in a pan. Let's hope it isn't the end of it. Um, my name's Jill Westcott. I'm a member of the task force because of my involvement with community groups, transition town groups, transition Exeter, parish councils, um, and other work groups working on climate. I have a background as economics and working for a more sustainable and just economy. And I bring some perspectives from that and from talking with councils about their difficulties in operating more sustainably and I want to gain a sense of a Devon-wide community that is working together to achieve the changes we need. Just, Thank you. Uh, Uh, thank you. Well, I'm Tony Greenham. I'm Executive Director of Southwest Mutual. Uh, we're aiming to set up a um, regional mutual bank with a mission to finance the just transition. Um, I've got a background in, in uh, banking, accountancy, sustainable finance. Um, that's the main expertise I'm bringing today. Although I'll also mention that for the Royal Society of Arts, I ran a deliberative democracy showcase called the Citizens Economic Council. Um, so I'm uh, very interested in learning today to, to get a sense of how, um, what level of ambition is, is sort of coming together through these hearings. Um, anyway. Thank you. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Wainwright. Um, I'm here. There was a word used earlier, miscellaneous, and I feel a bit miscellaneous. Um, but in a, it kind of framing that in a good way, I think I'm a generalist and a dot joiner, and I hope that's what I can bring. Um, I do a few things. I run a uh, charity. We work um, around the world on kind of community development um, and bringing people together to collaborate and start start with what's strong rather than with needs and what's not what's less good. Um, I'm also a green district councillor in Mid Devon. Um, I'm a contributing editor at The Ecologist. Um, and I do a bit of coaching and consulting, including for uh, a new organisation called New Prosperity Devon, um, which is looking at how do we build a more kind of inclusive economy in Devon. Um, so touching on circular economy, good procurement, social value and environmental value. Um, so, yeah, I hope I can bring that kind of dot joining and, you know, owning being a generalist. I think that's a good thing. Um, 
And what I hope to gain is, yeah, a sense of togetherness and kind of connection through people and also th how do these topics link together? How do we connect them um, and make that a, a, a strong thing? Thank you. Thanks. My name's Michael Titchford. I'm uh, responsible for planning and economic development town centres with North Devon Council. Been there uh, a year, worked in many local authorities up and down the government and worked in regeneration economic development primarily for uh, about 20 years. Uh, something I can bring, it's been mentioned already, starting to repeat, the, uh, the dot joining, the looking across agendas, although I've I'm a planner by profession. I've worked with social care clients, waste and recycling, a whole variety of services across a variety of local authorities um, in improvement and transformation programs. Um, what I'd like to bring, again, I think there's something around the, the partnership in my area of expertise and uh, profession. The partnership, frankly, is a little bit weak in Devon compared to every other part of the country I've worked. And I, I think there's great potential for... Um, bringing together people's uh, abilities, resources and expertise um, and I'm, uh, so I'm looking forward to hearing some positive progress and outcomes from this programme. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Deborah McCann. I'm a, a planning consultant with my own practice. I've worked across all the sectors for more years than I care to remember and um, I suppose I'm here really because of my understanding of rural communities and I'm a neighbourhood plan examiner and what I'm hoping to give to the day is my experience of rural communities and how they work and how services are delivered and how policy can influence that. And also what I would like to take away is something that I can take back to my own community to motivate them to, um, to act. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Doug Eltham. I'm leading on the um, climate emergency at Devon County Council and I'm here today in the capacity of note taking. I'm not, I'm not that important. Um, I'm David Sargent. I'm an associate professor in English here at the University of Plymouth. What I can bring, um, I work on how people imagine the future, um, how the future is imagined, and the possible kind of, I guess, the imaginative infrastructure um, that that can bring. What I'd like to take away is, and I've worked with um, region and South Devon energy communities around those kind of imagining alternative futures. And what I'd like to take away, I guess, is how that kind of background intersects with more applied and constrained practical contexts. Well. <clears throat> it's a fine rock, Harry, a fine rock. Um, my name is Jeremy Leggett. Uh, I'm from Acre, Action with Communities in Rural England. I'm the uh, policy advisor. We're a national network of 38 um, what we all used to call rural community councils, of which communities um, together in, uh, in Devon is, is one of our 38 members. I think what I can hopefully bring is a little wider context on uh, rural policy and rural development policy. Um, I, I would bow to those lo locally who are much more involved in rural communities within Devon, but clearly I have a rural community background um, as well. And what I'd like to take away, I think, is some messages and some lessons for our whole national network of what, how they can engage in this agenda locally and, and add more value to it through their work with communities. Hi, I'm Tim Jones. Um, I'm here as an observer uh, today for a brief time. I'm uh, afraid I've got to slip away uh, shortly. So I sit on the Net Zero Task Force. Um, uh, I chair the Southwest Business Council, so primarily I bring uh, the network links across four counties. So we have uh, engagement with about 80,000 businesses. So that touching point with uh, the business community is primarily uh, my objective in ensuring that uh, I add value to this initiative, which is hugely important. Um, but I also chair the foundation for uh, the North Devon, Northern Devon biosphere. Um, if you haven't heard of it, um, you're forgiven because a lot of people haven't um, watched this space. It will be the most important natural capital project we've got in Devon in five years' time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ian Bailey, uh, and I'm a lecturer uh, here at Plymouth, and I kind of specialise in environmental politics and sustainability issues, which in, in of itself takes me in quite a 
broad range of directions. If I can give a little bit of focus to that, uh, particularly interested in climate and energy policy, use of price incentives, uh, both for direct carbon reduction uh, and also to incentivize renewable energy, uh, but also quite a lot of interest in environmental behavior and, and how people are engaging uh, with a whole variety of sustainability issues, including climate change. Uh, I hope also to be able to bring a little bit of uh, kind of experience from outside of academia, because uh, I have had a rather checkered career, um, previously in the warehousing and logistics industry for about a decade or so, and now for my sins, um, sharing this academic career also with being a part-time um, beef farmer in Cornwall. So I'm, I'm outside of my comfort zone in Devon. Hi, I'm Angie Greenham and I've been working at the Dartington Hall Trust, um, essentially on fostering collaboration really, but in the context of uh, a place that is has a long history and legacy of experiment. I'm interested in how we foster collaboration on a broader scale, um, participatory processes for systems change. I'm really interested in the role of, um, or the deficit of social capital, um, within the context of our communities and how we talk about climate change in some ways as a public health issue. And um, like Elizabeth, I'm a, something of a generalist and as my um, cousin's 21 year old daughter told me this week, I'm, I'm bang on trend in that and apparently millennials call these people slashies. So I'm proud to be a slashy, whatever that means. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, I just want to observe that I don't think we've got anyone under 40 in the room today, so I'm interested in the role of younger people in these processes. <laughs> Hello, Emily. <laughs> Hi, I'm Emily and I'm under 40. <laughs> Um, so I'm the, the project manager for Devon Climate Emergency, working with Doug um, and uh, the task force members. <coughs> and um, I am primar primarily here today to um, help the day run smoothly and minute it. So yeah, let me know if there's anything I can help with. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now we're going to move into um, people giving their witness statements. So as you can see on the agenda, we've got questions there that were used to um, structure the uh, submissions um, that we received through the online portal. Um, we don't sort of expect you to be able to go through that list per se, but they're guiding questions. Um, and uh, we're most interested in, um, at this point, your suggestions for uh, actions and changes that need to be made. Um, I think we're starting with uh, finance and procurement. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. We just add that um, Emily has kindly volunteered to scribe for us as well. Okay, so um, I think everyone's got about five minutes to talk in this session um, just to try and keep the day going and get through everything that we have to on this uh, really busy agenda. Um, so yeah, it's just to really, the, the key actions, and, and I think the key here is rapid and extensive decarbonisation. So we're looking at transformative changes here in terms of what we need to do um, rather than sort of business as usual or, or sort of slow progress towards towards an end. Um, so I'm just going to hand round, I think we'll start with you Jill, if that's okay, just um, on that five minute guidance and as well as we're going round, just to save time, perhaps if people, because Emily's going to scribe here as she goes, you can sort of use that to expand on, on the topics that we're covering. I think it's fine to sort of say yeah, totally agree with what's been said and then if we can try and make it expansive as possible. Um, I want to say something non-specific which derives from several of our hearings and that you highlighted, Hannah, which is the need for uh, financial as well as um, what one might call moral incentives for not only behaviour change but for um, businesses, for farmers, uh, landowners and so on to be able to take into account the social and environmental values that we wish to bring into being. So, for example, in the land, food and sea hearing, we uh, 
mentioned the need for a price on carbon to inform the support that farmers and land managers would get for sequestering carbon, for uh, practices which support biodiversity and so on. So I'm just noting that and it happened in many other uh, sessions. I think to make practical the values that we've talked about, there is a big issue about uh, our national investment strategy and perhaps on a, a more local and regional basis about how the aim to decarbonise our economy gets realised in the way in which investment is both funded and applied. So um, I think at the moment, with the best will in the world and the criteria are not in place for that change in investment to happen. Um, so I'd like to make one negative point and two positive points. So the negative point is that at present, uh, many investments are primarily determined by what contribution they make to, for example, GDP or certainly uh, things measured in money. I believe some of the national, nationally funded investment is um, noted by GVA. Now, it's nothing new to uh, say that GDP is an inadequate measure of what we want, even were environment not to be on the horizon at all. And so we need to operationalise new criteria for that. And uh, the way in which an investment influences our greenhouse emissions needs to be incorporated in there. Some people would say it should be preeminent. I am not very familiar with the whole institutional framework in which that needs to be embedded and I would be indebted to Tim because I think he has much greater knowledge of how that would need to occur in order to make um, the economic actors able to take that into account and for there to be the viable opportunities that will bring that into being. But just looking at some of the centrally funded investments, um, for example, things that, that the local economic partnership has, um, a very high proportion of those are roads. And although those might be justified in reducing carbon emissions from traffic tangles, I think we need not to be patching up the older system, but instituting from a grassroots what will take us through to 2050 with a, a newer approach. The positive points are that um, not only greenhouse emissions, but the other co-benefits for health um, and for uh, social value, uh, I think you referred to it, Angie, need to be in there as well as the criteria. And that one would hope that then things that are called for in the mobility hearings, for example, transport hubs, uh, big investment, public transport, hydrogen economy, CCS is a hugely controversial area and others could comment better, but reforestation, restoring peat, wetland and carbon sequestration are needed. Thank you. Um, right, well, I'll, uh, it's obviously a huge, huge amount to cover. I, I, I'd like to make three points, I think. Um, one is about the provision of finance uh, for businesses and households in order to be able to uh, decarbonise their lives or their business models and whether we have in place the appropriate finance on fair terms for that or not. I suspect not, but... Um, I'd like to mention uh, an initiative that I'm part of. I'm on the steering committee of a program called Banking on a Just Transition, which is coordinated by the London School of Economics and UK Finance. And it is asking exactly that question. Uh, most of the major banks are involved. Uh, I'm the only representative of a small bank and I think the only person from the South West involved. Uh, but I think the point I'd like to make is that that, that uh, same initiative, looking at whether the right products are in place, I think could be repeated at a regional or county level. I mean, I think it might be more pr appropriate perhaps at the level of the South West Business Council. So that might be one of those areas, I noticed your last question, where slightly bigger spatial scale may be worth considering. But uh, I would, you know, get local providers of finance of, of all descriptions into the room um, and see if there's a way of um, examining whether um, the right sort of finance is in place. Because one of the key things that's been looked at is the concept of blended uh, finance. So in other words, it may be that what is needed is a combination of grants, 
loans on commercial terms, equity, patient capital, um, and maybe loans on less commercial terms. And often it, it might need a, a mix of these different forms of capital in order to be able to get the right kind of patient finance at the right rate to finance the transition in business models. Um, I mean, w one area that's particularly on my mind is, is agriculture, um, because huge transformations are going to need to take place that I'm not sure we have the finance uh, in place to be able to make those transitions. So that first point is, uh, as an action point, is really whether um, a, a... I mean, I'm convening a workshop for Banking on Just Transition um, in Cornwall, already at the Eden Project, but that is um, uh, to which, indeed, I, I will extend invitations to, to this to see if somebody can come to represent Devon. But I think there's more work to be done. So the second thing I'd like to mention, um, and here I obviously have to declare an interest. So um, as somebody who has uh, co-founded and is trying to set up a regional mutual bank, unsurprisingly, I think part of the solution is a regional mutual bank. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, this could be capitalised uh, through local authority investment as well as alongside other investors. This is the conversations that we've been having uh, for a while. Um, uh, now, this is a bit of a slow burn because it's not an instant job getting a banking licence. Uh, but, you know, we are talking about a transition over a decade or more and, and putting in a, a regional institution which has as part of its mission to finance this transition, I believe, um, is, is an important component. Uh, and just to put that sort of very obvious conflict of interest in me pr proposing that into, into context, I spent 10 years in an, as an economist studying this and recommending it. So I'm doing it because I already thought it was a good idea. I'm not saying it's a good idea because I'm doing it. So the third point I want to mention is pensions. Um, now, I, uh, I mean, obviously the impact of this might well be well outside the county, but within the county, there is an awful lot of money that people hold in their pension funds, which at the moment may be supporting us towards a business as usual 3.3 degree or worse outcome, right? Now, pensions are very complicated. People don't particularly want to spend a lot of time thinking about them. Uh, and here I think leadership is required. So um, before getting on to what I think the, the, a useful action here would be, I would like to quote to you um, something that Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, said yesterday at the Conference of Parties in Madrid. Uh, he said, changes in climate policies, new technologies and growing physical risks will prompt reassessments of the value of virtually every financial asset. Firms that align their business models with the transition to net zero will be rewarded handsomely. Those that fail to adapt will cease to exist. Now is the time to ensure that every financial decision takes climate change into account. Every financial decision takes climate change into account, says the Governor of the Bank of England, former Goldman Sachs investment banker. Now in that context, I think it would be, uh, as a matter of urgent priority, I think that... Um, uh, the Devon County Pension Fund needs to re revisit its investment policy in the light of what we now know about the urgency of climate change and the declaration of a climate emergency. Because the investment policy uh, is not aligned with environmental social governance best practice. I say this and again I declare another interest. I'm uh, an advisor to one of the city's leading ESG fund managers. Uh, the, the pension fund has in it uh, three or four all related stocks, one of them being um, a Russian one. And incredibly to me, the uh, investment policy actually gives the example of oil and gas uh, saying that it should own the stocks and engage with them to ensure the continued delivery of shareholder value returns in the medium to long term in an oil company. Right? Directly contradictory with other elements of the policy. So I think uh, if leadership is required, I would urge that the Pension uh, Investment uh, Committee revisits its policy on how the county's, uh, public sector workers in this county's own pensions are invested, because it is out of line with what Mark, Car what Carney, Mark Carney is saying and what best practice is. And I think that leadership is important because also uh, that could send a very strong signal uh, to other employers in the region that also have employees with their funds invested in potentially things which are directly, directly contradictory to what the group here is trying to achieve. Thank you, Tony. Thanks. Um, I, I've got a million things I could say in the spirit of dot joining, but I'm going to try and kind of um, 
I, I suppose, theme those. Um, and there's a couple of broader thoughts and a few specific thoughts, which I suspect will be, we'll dig into deeper later on in conversation. Um, firstly, there's something about the language around all this. Um, there's a quote I love, and I can't remember who said it, but it talks about how ed the best education comes through delight. Um, so when we are bringing in these concepts of procurement and social value, how are we framing these and how are we um, communicating them in a way that sort of, you know, attracts people and turns them on rather than make, sends them to sleep? Um, so I think there's something there that's quite interested, interesting, particularly, yeah, words like procurement and um, which aren't in sort of our day-to-day -day language. Um, um, related to that, I think there's a real role um, or a need for both local um, politics and local authorities and also local media to feel reaffirmed and confident in their role um, in bringing about some of these things at a local level across Devon. So when I think about media, um, there is this kind of real tendency to, to use us versus them language. Um, and I think that's a real challenge. So for example, um, one of the roles that I have as a district councillor is connecting with farmers. Um, and you start to touch on some of these green issues, climate, and immediately defences go up. And I don't think the media has helped in the kind of farmers versus environmentalists um, issue and it's it's really not helpful so i think when we think about devon which is predominantly an agricultural place how do we not only bring farmers into the center of these discussions but but make the media a um an aid and a support and a champion really of these conversations i think that's an interesting thing to go into um when it comes to more specific things, so like procurement and so on, again, I wear a different hat. So I'm, a, I'm an elected councillor um, and I'm also working with New Prosperity Devon, looking at some of this stuff. So I'm kind of seeing it through lots of different um, angles, which I think is a strength. Um, one of the obvious bits of low-hanging fruit for local authorities is that a lot of them, including my own, have declared a climate emergency. Um, a lot of them are going through carbon baselining exercises. So where is the starting point? Where are we aiming to get to? A big chunk of that, my understanding is that a big chunk of that um, sort of carbon baseline information shows that procurement is a significant chunk of um, the carbon uh, footprint of an authority. So that's a really good, obvious starting point. Um, one of the challenges related to that for local authorities is obviously officer time and capacity. I see every day the stress that officers are under um, and it's unsustainable. Um, so how do we support them? This, this can't be another burden. This can't be an extra thing on their workload. This has to, this has to um, facilitate things that they want to do um, in a sort of sustainable way, not be another stress. I think that's really important. Um, uh just lost my thought um and related to that so yes yeah, support for officers um but also support for on the flip side of things the kind of um smes local businesses how do we support them to get access to some of these larger contracts whether that's breaking down contracts into smaller lots reducing some of the financial requirements and, and um, hurdles that small businesses need to jump over to get access to these contracts. I think there's some real room for innovation there. Um, I think I think all of this stuff can be a real opportunity, it's an opportunity for innovation. Um, again, not another layer of burden to add to things. Um, I think collaboration is a really underrated skill um, and related to that listening. These are not luxuries. How do we, how do we make collaboration, not just a word and a tick box, but a thing that generates um, outcomes and, 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 and good things. We recently ran some workshops with uh, at New Prosperity Devon and some of the comments we heard from that was, and these were from senior procurement officers at big institutions like the university and Exeter and so on, 
people said we want to be part of these conversations this is a great opportunity to connect and collaborate we don't do it enough help us to do it more because there's lots of ideas here we just need to speak to the right people and um and and start sharing those ideas um a couple of other points have already been said, like the need to go beyond GDP. I think that's a really important one. That's quite a broad point. Um, and also, in sort of link back to the procurement thing, how how are we? How is this an opportunity for outcome-led innovation and solutions? Um, so, for example, in Norway, I believe there was a um, a, a call out to create a new f a transport system. I think it was a ferry, um, but rather than say we need a new electric ferry, the call out was we need a ferry that will reduce carbon emissions. Go, and it was it, there was a real you know innovation exercise there, um, and the resulting ferry is leading the way, pioneering. It's a great model of public transport. So how do we not get too sort of control freaky about outcomes? Um, yeah, and then. Yeah, I think going back to something I've already said, it's the it's the rural rural versus urban divide. I was at a meeting last night um, with in my role as a councillor. Um, a lot of people in rural places feel a bit sidelined from these conversations. Not intent, you know, it's not intentional, obviously. But I, going back to the us versus them thing, how do we make this clear that it's not just, you know, for Exeter and for the sort of glamorous urban centres, how is this relevant for a farmer in deepest, darkest mid-Devon where I represent who's really struggling? How do we join up these conversations? Brilliant, thank you. Thanks. We're moving straight on to planning. Hi. Um, I'm sure a number of these points have been taken up in other discussions and James has identified some of the, the planning issues. Um, the National Planning Policy Framework talks about sustainable development, however the, the planning system does not encourage or deliver sustainable development. I'm not even sure that is the, f the intention of it. If there is a, a degree of sustainability in that uh, objective, it's around I think community and economy and environment really doesn't figure in a way that we would understand sustainable development. One of the key, I think, illustrations of the, the weakness in the planning system is that basically planning policy is incrementally meeting the current and forecast needs of a community for dwellings, for economic activity, employment floor, floor space and all the associated development that goes on. There's an underlying principle there that growth will be ongoing and continual. Um, however, the planning system doesn't successfully look to the long term, the life, plan, the life of a local plan. It's an incremental plan. It's not looking at what the future state could or should be. Government has been encouraging in the last few years, after of course doing away with um, regional bodies and structure plans, it's encouraging local authorities, public bodies to look at strategic plans. So with a 20 to 30 year time frame rather than 10 to 15, which is going to encourage more looking at the future state that we're aiming to achieve. However, that's an onerous exercise in the extra area, for instance, one partner's dropped out. It has to be done at a partnership level, and which is exacerbated when we're in a two-tier area like this, um, where you have districts competing, you have tensions between city and districts in terms of the districts surrounding for instance, Exeter taking on the growth uh, of the Exeter community. So I think that there's a fundamental problem for me with the planning system in uh, the short-term nature of it. It's perhaps the longest-term strategy that uh, local authorities um, have, but it's still incremental uh, and therefore not setting that proper context for us. Uh, I, I, there are great opportunities, I think, through the current planning system. I'm, fan of neighbourhood plans. However, in my district, North Devon, we don't have any in place. Talking to a large number of representatives and parish at our uh, regular forum with them and, and giving them some guidance around the planning process, there was frankly uh, acknowledgement of the value of neighbourhood plans, particularly as they are able to introduce search areas the discussions around wind turbines, we don't have any in our local plan, therefore we cannot even consider 
wind turbines. Um, that can be done through the neighbourhood planning process. However, the, the reps were very clear that just the resource and the time scale that James mentioned, even for a neighbourhood plan, is hugely discouraging. It's costly, there is some funding available, but expecting small rural parishes to engage in a local plan is a huge demand, but there could be so much achieved through those to reflect locally the needs of their community. And returning to the point about the incremental nature of planning, I think it, it really quite epitomised in rural communities, and James and I have had discussions, where we predict what the need of a rural community is particularly, uh, and then plan to meet that. We don't look at what is the future sustainable or best sustainable future for that community. So we don't plan for the longer term. We draw a boundary, often very quite tightly, around that community. Say development can only go on within that boundary, the rest is countryside, which effectively, I think, restricts the ability to respond to the needs of that community in terms of what sort of employment spaces do we need to have that local employment that means that people don't need to travel? Um, how do we create the community facilities within settlements that meets their future needs? Um, uh, uh, the, the planning system finds that very difficult to do. It, it's a very blunt tool in terms of, I say, drawing a boundary line around a community so you can develop up to this point. The other really negative impact for me is that green infrastructure is a big thing at the moment and that's what used to be called open space, parks and open spaces and, and such like. Um, and the green infrastructure is uh, moving us in the right direction. However, I think we need to go beyond that, beyond the play spaces, the green spaces that a community needs by some formula that's identified for uh, communities to have access to these spaces, which is very valuable. We need to look um, much more at the environmental value of those spaces in terms of green corridors, looking at nature recovery areas, which really figures very little in the system. And it will catch up, but as James said again, it will catch up too slowly, I believe. There is something very fundamental as well about green spaces in communities. Drawing a red boundary around a community tends to mean that planners look favourably at development within that. Those green, informal green spaces, it may be a field that in, uh, in makes an incursion into a community. It may be a, 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 a rough area or, or a, a play spaces do tend to be protected but those green spaces will will if they're within the red line be built on removing the the uh, value that they have for the community and the exposure to more natural uh, environments so a whole range of of issues there and just to finish off on planning development management it does i'm afraid still tend to be uh, it achieves the least worst uh, instead of the uh, the the best outcome. The planning system is quite risk averse. It seeks to, to mitigate risk um, and although I think the planning guidance which is yes we're looking for best outcomes, in practice I think planning officers assessing applications uh, are not, don't feel they have su sufficient support from the system and the process and if it should go to appeal the inspectors to be able to demand the best possible for that location and that community. So if you take into account both the policy context and how it's applied, I think there's a whole range of issues colleagues mentioned about the lack of resources which undoubtedly um, figures in this. Um, and as a, I am a planner, but as a, an economic development regeneration practitioner for, for many years, so I be, work a lot with local enterprise partnerships and would recognise the comments that, that have been made there around their focus. It's really encouraged for the heart of the South West that we're looking at inclusive growth, good growth, clean growth. However, I, undeniably, I think we haven't seen fundamentally the direction change in terms of how economic partnerships seek to provide those community and environmental uh, goods. It's still focused, although moving, on where you can get the quick wins in the, the major conurbations. I th just to, to round up, uh, for me, mention about the LEP, there's also the Joint Committee. Um, we haven't really talked this morning about localisation agenda, which was much mooted in the Cameron government, which I don't think was really come to very much. What I, uh, and linked to that, a place-based approach. My title is of head of place, but talking to colleagues, place is simply used as shorthand so that I didn't have a, a title uh, of head of 
economic development, regeneration and planning and the other bits as, as well, but places this distinct discipline and approach to how you deliver best outcomes. And I don't, it's well known, well researched, well understood, and the benefits are huge. So I think bringing that place-based approach to how we understand localities and the value of the environment is not nearly enough uh, understood or implemented. Um, and finally, joint committee, we've got a, a mechanism across the two counties, the, the LEP geography, to be recognising what the great value this area has. I say the focus is moving away from the conurbation and traditional views on economy to some extent with the uh, LEP. However, it seems quite odd to me that we haven't really capitalised on the great natural capital in this area and Tim mentioned the, the biosphere. You know, why haven't we got a Devo deal on uh, environmental goods, on natural capital? Um, Re reflecting on a workshop uh, over a year ago in, in Exeter uh, to look at the idea of natural capital and how we can invest in it. And dozens of central government agencies all working to central government agendas, um, spending tens of millions of pounds in the locality, and uh, very little control uh, locally, very little understanding of how those uh, funding streams knit together. So we've talked a lot this morning about finance and funding. However, we haven't really looked, uh, I think, at how we can do better with what we already have. Localise that, localise decision making, uh, engage with communities in, in planning and economic development and place-based approaches, which uh, or I think, again, we, we all would aspire to, but there just isn't the resources, the will, I don't think, all the mechanisms or processes currently to achieve those. Thank you. Um, I have lots of things I could say, I suppose, as my most recent expertise is based around neighbourhood plans. I ought to focus on that, really. Um, I've examined lots of neighbourhood plans, over 40, across the country. Um, and I also support communities to develop their own neighbourhood plans. What I would say, my experience of neighbourhood plans, is that they are unambitious. Um, they lack sufficient support for communities to be able to address the issues that um, we're talking about today. You know, there is a lack of understanding of what green infrastructure means. Um, there is too much focus on housing. Um, and it is unreasonable to expect a group of, of um, people with no expertise in planning to deliver. I mean, it, it, I'll be blunt about it, even though it's on camera. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, government speak with forked tongue. Yes, it gives, it, it, the strap line is communities can take control of their, um, their future. But actually, when it comes down to um, examining those plans in the way I have to, uh, you know, communities are actually extremely constrained in what they can do. Um, and one of the things that, that could be done in policy terms, it, it to, because you, you can, you can, it does take about three or four years for most communities to, to develop a neighbourhood plan, but they could develop them more. When they start reviewing those plans, it could be done more quickly. And if, if, if proper support was given, they could be more ambitious in looking at... I mean, there's so, ma so many um, neighbourhood plans I've examined don't mention biodiversity, um, green infrastructure, any of those things at all. Um, because they... Either because of the people developing them or because of, of, of the sort of... they picked up on the fact that they need to focus on, uh, on one, one side of it, not the things that can be really added, they can really add value at a local level. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that's something that, that really needs to be done. And I think that when it comes to developing, particularly, you know, straying into more general policy <coughs> on planning, when you're looking at um, delivering for rural communities, there's far too much focus on housing delivery and not looking at balanced communities and how that can be funded, so how you can fund um, things that go along to make sure... I remember a long time ago, I think probably when I worked for the Community Council of Devon, um, there was a report that went around, it was called Plugging the Leaks, mm -hmm. and looking at how you, yeah, how you can actually you know, make your, your community leak-proof, keeping everything within it uh, in a virtuous way, and I think we need to go back to looking at that but 
one of the things, and maybe I'm being unfair in this, one of the things I've kind of picked up in the discussion so far, I, f I feel the focus could be too much on doing stuff to people rather than them doing it for themselves. Another thing I picked up once talking to someone at a Tamar Valley AOMB discussion, you know, you can make people feel, you give, you give people a dependency if you are giving, you are doing things to them rather than encouraging and giving them the tools to do them themselves. So in terms of how can you do finance for local communities, how can you deliver things, you, you know, we should be facilitating communities doing it for themselves and taking ownership of that and looking at what finance they need. You know, I was talking to my parish council, I'd like to put in some electric charging points. What do we need to do to, to, to facilitate that community doing it for it themselves rather than somebody else coming along and doing it to them? Thanks. Um, I'll keep this brief and not try not to repeat anything that's already been said. Um, but thinking about behaviour change, um, thinking about there's a difference, I think, between an awareness that change is practically feasible and a belief that it's possible and meaningful, and a difference between an intellectual knowledge that change is available and even financially advantageous and feeling in your bones that it's urgently necessary and will actually be sustained and make a difference. Um, how that's tackled is obviously a huge question and it's also something that the idea of how we imagine or think or believe shouldn't displace or distract from very hard, concrete, practical questions. But intersecting with ideas of framing and communicating, how that's not just a question of how we market individual reforms, but how imagining a decarbonized Devon in as concrete and realistic as way as possible could first make its um, possibility more of a felt reality, and how that imagining can also act like a musculature or a skeleton to join up and hold together different themes and projects and efforts, and to make those different areas one sustained effort. How that imagining happens, um, Obviously a huge open question, conceptually and practically. I mean, it needs to be interdisciplinary. You can imagine psychology, anthrop anthropology, as well as people who deal in stories. You need to engage communities. It can't be a top-down thing. There also needs to be top-down. So finding the scale of sweet spot. And also time and money, t money are also limited and people are overburdened. So you don't want to make this kind of thing, any kind of projects like this, an extra burden. I hope to jump through, but I wonder how landmark kind of efforts to hold together the different things we're all thinking about in the form of imagining actually what a decarbonized Devon looks like, how that can be a kind of chicken and egg, carrot and stick. It comes to seem possible, but it's also not yet here, and so there's something concrete to work towards and sustain. Chairman, if I may just, just make an additional observation. I, 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 but Jeremy's very kindly said I can jump, jump ahead. I just wanted to add uh, a, a couple of observations because I need to leave in a couple of minutes um, to uh, Jill and Tony's observations about finance. It would be very easy for us to assume that uh, the rhetoric from Mark Carney is just um, um, macro thinking that may or may not happen um, in the near future. Um, the fact is that the momentum in the financial commercial markets at the moment behind climate change uh, and all the surrounding issues uh, is huge. Um, um, the Bank of England have already imposed some very significant sanctions in addition to the rhetoric from Mark Carney. Uh, they now require that all financially regulated bodies have a, um, a sustainability di director. Um, it's a really important role. Um, and that starts to reflect the fact that uh, climate change will bear down upon uh, the huge number of property assets that are now vulnerable uh, to climate change uh, in floodplains, etc., etc. Uh, and if you look at the direction of travel uh, as to, we had um, um, in, uh, invited uh, um, um, Michael Lewis last night, who's the boss of uh, E.ON. Uh, that's a company in the energy sector 
sector that's completely transformed um, its trading platforms to address the issue of climate change, um, smart meters just being one uh, example of that. But if you look at um, how the market is reacting to some of these uh, opportunities, the um, uh, Saudi Aramco uh, flotation uh, has pretty much failed. Um, it will succeed, but um, uh, the uh, shareholder market, the pension market, your point, Tony, critically important, uh, is now starting to vote with its feet uh, about where the point of investment should be. And if you're a Fortune 500 company in the States uh, and you don't address sustainability, then you will be punished badly as a, co a corporate, your corporate activities will be punished badly. So there's a huge momentum here that we need to capture. Um, but it's, it's very easy to assume that we're doing this in isolation and that uh, out there um, the, the market is just ignoring it. Uh, that is not the case. Our experience is that there is a huge, huge appetite uh, if we can get the agenda right. And it's one of the issues that we are addressing around the biosphere, which is a unique opportunity, which is already attracting uh, significant interest. And just to give you a little bit of comfort, um, one of the most recent discussions we've had uh, on that was with, um, with the Church of England, funnily enough, um, uh, who are keen to um, be al aligned with the climate change emergencies generally. Uh, and their appetite to direct some of their investment policies, um, they have huge investment portfolios, um, but also to adjust their um, uh, management of their glebe estates, which again are huge around the country, um, so that farming regimes can be realigned to be one more profitable to uh, to reflect um, the environment um, and the quality uh, of um, uh, new techniques and practices that could be applied to achieve much greater levels of sustainability. So the 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 the, the point um, I, I wish to just finalise um, my comments on is that out there the market is coming up with its own responses to this. Uh, this does not need a huge amount of government intervention. Uh, this is an area where business is now really listening and that, that I find very encouraging. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Jeremy. Sorry to do that. <coughs> I assume, Chairman, that on this side of the table we are more at the behavioural change end of the, um, uh, the agenda rather than the financial planning. Um, I, I hope it's okay if I just very quickly say a couple of things on those first two as well, if that if that that's all right, um, and I think the first thing to say is I think someone reflected earlier that there's nobody here under forty. I suspect there's not very many people who are here over sixty. Maybe uh, maybe the odd uh, the odd one or two. Um, uh, for forty years, we have been so consistently told that market mechanisms are the only way to make any anything happen to make any change happen that we now believe it to be true um uh since the early 80s e every any change that anyone's attempted to make has been through market and pricing type mechanisms it was not always thus and it won't be in the future and i just think we need we need to just have a little bit of perspective on whether using market type mechanisms like pricing is actually the best way of making behavior change happen in in a very rural area which has evolved over centuries to be reliant on carbon-based inputs simply implementing uh, taxation or pricing based mechanisms to get people's behavior to change will simply layer further social injustice on the people least able to cope with it who are already most disadvantaged by where they live in a in a rural area so on the finance end I just think we need to be very careful before our knee-jerk reaction to everything is pricing market mechanisms return on investment and all of that there are other ways to make change happen as well and I think it's very important to remember that in rural areas where their defining characteristic is already market failure in the delivery of almost everything to people who live there so I think we just have to have keep that in mind all the time that's my lot on finance <laughs> um, on planning um, what I think one sees in a lot of places is is the planning profession architects developers feeling they are being hugely virtuous in finding a way of building a small number of houses or development that are just within themselves carbon neutral 
And it looks jolly impressive when you write it up in their trade press and say, you know, look what we've done. We've built these 10 houses and they're, they're completely carbon neutral. But it has done nothing to shift to a carbon neutral future for that whole community. So I think what we have to do when thinking particularly about directing development and planning and also trying to do that holistically over how services are delivered as well is think about what, how, can, how can development and particularly housing be planned in a way that enables that whole community to become more carbon neutral. And that may mean more development, not less, in order to make local services more viable, not less, so that you don't find yourself doing incredibly stupid things like closing small schools and therefore putting a whole load more families on the road morning and evening, when in fact actually you could make that whole community more sustainable if you enabled it to have more housing and had that discussion long term, probably through the neighbourhood development plan process with that community about its long-term future rather than its coping with the next five years of uh, housing supply figures which is about where they're at at the moment for most most neighborhood plans that is my lot on planning although i might come back to it um, behavior change people need motivation they need to see that what they are doing as a community is going to make a difference and um, that in this area can be quite difficult because it feels like they're being hectored and lectured from above. So actually, what, what from a community development point of view, and my significant background over the last 30 years has been through rural community development, is that people need, need to see what's possible. They need to have help to make it possible for their own community. They need permission to act often and it's not always clear where the most convincing source of permission to act comes from. It can be quite subtle in rural communities, which means working in a community development way with communities to make, to make things happen. But crucially, and this has been my personal kind of learning journey throughout my working life, working with rural communities, actually more important than all of those is that if people are going to act locally, they need to feel they have permission to fail as well. Because if they feel that they go out on a limb to make something happen in their community, and if it doesn't quite work out, everyone's going to jump on them and blame them, then they won't do it in the first place. So permission to fail is every bit as important as permission to act. And it's one of the real, real un unwritten tools and rules of, of working with particularly rural communities, which can be a bit goldfish bowl like and uh, Harry and his his colleagues at uh, Community Together will be very well aware that that's that's the sort of techniques you need to have behind you when you're working with rural communities um, and the very last thing and I'm afraid it's, it's bringing all of those together and it is perhaps slightly um, going back to planning as well um, in England 17% of the population live in rural areas live in rural communities only 17% it's, it, um, you know, it's, it's a relatively small proportion of the population as a whole, which is why politically it has so little clout. Um, however, the relationship between urban and rural areas, particularly over our food systems, um, have evolved together. We, we are, are, you know, six, seven million person urban centres have evolved alongside the food systems and other consumption systems that enable them to exist. I don't think we should rule out that in, in order to meet the 2050 kind of targets, that actually as a country we should deliberately allow, if not allow, encourage the proportion of people living in rural to rural areas to rise from 17% to something much higher than that because actually we have no experience whatsoever of serving 6 7 million person cities without huge carbon based fossil fuel inputs and it may simply not be possible if you just look not just at the inputs that go into providing the food for those cities, but the inputs that have to go into providing the logistics and the infrastructure and everything else. It may not be possible, 
however much the planners love simply tacking lots and lots of houses onto urban areas because they can serve them with a bus route, actually it might be much better if people were living in smaller rural communities where they can be served differently and better. And we need actually to understand that it's our urban society that has driven our use of fossil fuels and we need to row back from that. I think enough. I must have gone over my five minutes. Just to clarify, because I'm a task force member, do you want me to say th something or do you want me just... Please go for it. Go for it. Okay, so I'm going to speak briefly about uh, the behaviour change theme uh, and kind of summarise the kind of situation, I guess, at the present point in time. We're in, in quite general terms, we have a public that, when asked about these sorts of things, expresses quite considerable interest and concern about climate change, uh, but yet to exhibit... Uh, those concerns in a, a, any kind of really strong sense in shifts in behaviour. Uh, clearly this needs to change because so much of, of actually what we're talking about here is going to depend on, on, on people's routine activities and the way that people are travelling differently, engaging more actively with energy consumption, and energy production, uh, eating differently and so on and so forth. Uh, but in order to make those changes we have to be very honest, brutally honest, uh, and confront some basic realities o o about the things that are going to discourage or prevent people from um, expressing their concerns through behaviour. Uh, one is going to be basic lifestyle needs uh, and norms, and in the run-up to Christmas this is horribly starkly in, in focus. Uh, the second one is perceptions of control and responsibility, so encompassing a whole range of things from a, a sense that's, that there are actually plausible solutions that can be implemented uh, and what they would what they do uh, actually makes any material difference to the you know, quite grand scale problems uh, uh, and a particular one that I uh, I'm concerned with is so basically uh, sporadic attention to climate issues so that when people are asked yes they are very concerned about these sorts of issues uh, but we uh, again the election is is kind of um, helping to show us this, other sets of priorities and, and, and kind of the challenge of how to keep issues related to climate salient to people in their everyday lives. So that's kind of the diagnostic part of it, the, the kind of how do you begin to get some sort of traction against those, those types of problems uh, and hearing very clearly what you were saying Jeremy about incentive regimes uh, and certainly prices way of in incentives, you know, what sort of incentive regimes are going to elicit maintain and maintain changes in behaviour and the maintenance of, of change is a really important part of that challenge, embedding it and also uh, uh, just keeping uh, uh, the forefront of our minds the idea of simplicity. If we're going to be asking you know, people in their everyday lives to be doing complex onerous things uh, then that's ultimately likely to fail uh, because of kind of the breadth but shallowness of people's engagement with climate issues uh, and just keeping things simple uh, is a really important ingredient here. Um, the second how is kind of thinking imaginatively about the way that climate issues are framed and discussed to keep them salient to everybody's everyday lives uh, and I think here just as one illustration of that um, thinking about action on climate change in terms of life benefits to individuals, not just in terms of altruistic responses to an existential climate threat, because uh, you know, whilst there might be quite a lot of altruistic people out there, there's an awful lot of people for whom climate change is only going to be, or concerns about climate change are only going to be, going to be expressed in behaviour if they also have accompanying benefits to people's everyday lives. Uh, and the final element, before I pass on, is, is kind of thinking about leadership uh, to, to help to deal with some of these perceptions of control and responsibility issues. So leadership by example, uh, by businesses, uh, by local governments, at whatever uh, tier that we're talking about or functionality that we're talking about, leadership by inspiration, particularly I think here about community-led uh, initiatives uh, and uh, leadership through lesson drawing. Uh, and, and perhaps we don't do enough of this when we're thinking about climate emergencies to think about those past examples where actually fundamental shifts in people's attitudes and behaviours have been more successful in the past. Okay, I think I'll leave it at that. Um. Explicitly acknowledging that um, much of the action that's needed is not going to be within the gift of, of the local council to deliver feels really 
uh, mission critical. Um, breaking with traditional leadership models and um, looking at uh, systems based uh, leadership is going to be really important in terms of behaviour change. So the council's role uh, as a leader of a whole systems approach. Um, in order to act, I think we need to be talking about regenerative land use, conservation agriculture. We need to look at food shocks. Um, I think we're already in a space where actually experiencing food shocks is is close at hand, if not already happening. Um, it's It might be that um, the impact of a food shock will actually support the change that, that's, that's needed in terms of how we uh, think about and look at how rural areas supply food, not just for rural areas, but for urban areas. Um, so different approaches to land management, food and waste systems are going to feed into uh, the behavioural change that we need to see. Um, I think we, in terms of the action that's needed, we also need to be talking about how we host communities and how we ask communities and how we enable communities. I think we um, partnership is pretty obviously pretty integ integral to um, how we might succeed and I think the National Trust has a lot to offer in terms of spirit of place and that public conversation um, and co-production in communities so asking bigger questions about the type of society economy and environment that we want to live with and that the people in communities want to see for their children and their grandchildren and um, if each community was able to identify its own genius loci I think that we could centre some of the behaviour change in spirit of place everybody knows what's special about their place and I think that could be um, very a very generative uh, approach to co-production so, but obviously the way that communities live and operate is, is very much bound up with the infrastructure for transport, jobs and homes. And um, I think we need to recognise, um, as I think Jeff was saying, that as Jeremy was saying, that the um, approach needs to be emergent and that we need to create the space to experiment. And we need those places that, uh, like Dartington, that do create the opportunity to experiment because, it, especially I think in land use, um, it's a peer group, so how do you, every farmer and land agent that needs to go on the on the journey of um, towards regenerative land use, it needs to there needs to be permission uh, to innovate and permission to fail. Um, we've got some great uh, frameworks that we can we can locate in the community co-production behaviour change piece, and I think Project Drawdown the nine planetary boundaries and the UN Sustainable Development Goals do provide those foundational frameworks to start to look at um, co-production towards behaviour change. So, um, again, in terms of answering the sort of the, the question about what action is needed, uh, then I think in order to grow the potential and the capacity for behaviour change, we need to look at asset-based approaches. Um, we need to let that come from the ground up in communities and and um, in order for that to be successful. So I think what I want to sort of talk very briefly, tell a very brief uh, story about, I'll try and race through it, um, is some work I did with a, a small arts organisation that works uh, uh, locally in its community of Coniston in the Lake District, but also nationally and internationally. And... Um, we found uh, that in Coniston, and I'm very interested in this because it very much relates to our own challenges in Devon, that we needed to be talking about with the community and looking at the uh, triple issue of um, the dominance of the visitor economy, the hidden underemployment and um, unemployment associated with that, the lack of rural, rural affordable housing and um, public health. And when we talk about behaviour change and um, climate crisis, we need to acknowledge that there's a complexity at work in the system where we can't talk about one thing without looking at the complexity of those challenges. Um, I had a conversation recently with um, um, Malcolm at Visit Cornwall and he said that at some days um, last summer, Cornwall was actually full to capacity. Uh, at the, I want to sort of relate that work in Coniston back to our own joint um, local neighbourhood plan 
in Kingsbridge where there is a great sense of impotence about um, the impact of second homes, the lack of affordable rural housing for young people, um, the huge social capital challenges in our community, uh, which is really, to all intents and purposes, a, a sort of a gated c community, um, where increasingly there are people in our community who are not engaged and who, who don't feel any sense of ownership of um, their own day-to-day -day reality, never mind a, a problem like climate change. So I think we, we need to locate our discussions about climate change in our economy, and it is a visitor economy, and we need to be talking about better places to live and better places to visit. Thank you. And the one thing I wanted to add, really, is that we, there is always a danger, and I'm not saying that we're doing it here, but there is always a bit of a danger that the climate change discussion can be rather middle class um, and that we ignore poverty. And it's really much easier in rural communities if you're, you're, you know, live in a middle class way to make good choices on things um, and much more difficult if you're in poverty where you only have one access to one local shop and you know lots of those things aren't well i could go on forever but but that's that's the thing and i, and I think it doesn't it doesn't understand people's everyday experience where as we were saying you know it's what's happening in your immediate you know the next couple of hours or the next day or something rather than being able to plan so one of the huge things is to be more inclusive in this rather than it just being something about nice people doing nice things Just on the uh, behaviour change issue, and um, Jeremy, I'd love to have a, a, another word with you about what you feel other than financial incentives is vital, because that, that would be very interesting. But I found that um, in my research, there's a validity about a financial discussion which doesn't apply. It seems as if we are all altruistic, but we don't believe that anyone else is. And we have a fear of looking fluffy so the 5p on the plastic bags is a rationale for changing one's decision. It's not because people can't afford 5p. It's an indicator. It's a symbol. And sometimes financial incentives allow that discussion. They permit officers to say, well, really, we should change what we're doing. Because there's that money which makes dialogue possible. Whereas if it's altruistic, people are a bit shy to say, we should do this because of climate change. Thank you all. Um, thank you for that discussion. That was really interesting. Um, we're just going to take, noting that we're a bit behind time, a five-minute break, if that's okay with everyone, five-minute comfort break. We're, as co-chairs, going to have a bit of a discussion in that five minutes as to how we run the next session. I think we're conscious that a number of you need to get away early, um, and it's just how we, we then run the session afterwards. So you may see a slight tweak to the agenda uh, in terms of what we've planned, but um, we'll, we'll pick that back up in five minutes' time, if that's okay. And likewise, those who are on the webcast um, will be back with you shortly. Thank
Cheers, folks. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. So we're going to not break out into different groups. We're going to stay together in our table because um, we want that conversation between everybody. But we are going to just make sure that the first, well, the next hour is going to be quite tightly held by the the chairs. Um, we're going to ask questions that we've got, uh, some that we've got prepared and some that have come out of that conversation, some that we'll pick up on organically. Um, obviously, do feel free to comment back on what other people are saying uh, or have said. But um, we're very keen that if we're going to ask a question, we just want two or maximum three people to try and answer that question. Some of them will be addressed to specific individuals. Other questions, maybe you will... Um, just sort of nominate yourself to, to answer that. Um, and then please bring the mic back to us just after two or, or three people. Uh, towards the end of um, the, the day, we're going to be having that more free-flowing uh, dialogue between members and witnesses here. So um, I'm going to start. Um, I've got a question, really, uh, that's come out. A couple of people have mentioned risk. The, the sort of permission to fail aspect. Uh, and I'm very curious as to address that to the finance and procurement arm of the table around um, a the, the culture of risk um, in procurement and, and how people are funded, working with uh, small social enterprises and um, community groups. There's often this sort of emphasis on, on seed funding, um, accepting they might fail, but once those those funds start raising higher, um, they're, not, <laughs> they're not there. So um, I'm interested in your views on risk uh, and explicitly where funding is going, uh, rather whether to smaller organisations and enterprises or to um, sort of more established bodies. I hope that's clear. Can I pass that to you first, Tony, as you're nodding? Yes. Uh, I might have been on an auto nod there. I'm not <laughs> sure that. Uh, and I think... Um, so I think, uh, that I think there might have been a, uh, a, a couple of different questions in there. Um, the one about smaller versus medium-sized companies, certainly the evidence we see is that, um, if I can use the jargon, I'm sure everyone here, but for the SMEs, small and medium-sized enterprises, the medium-sized enterprises are well served with finance generally, and that would also be true in Devon. Uh, the smaller down the scale you get, the, the more difficult it is to access finance. 60% um, of the businesses in Devon or the West Country more generally are just sole traders. Okay, so they're not, they're not, um, and they're not above the VAT threshold, so they're under 85,000 turnover, they don't, own any, they don't have any employees, they're not limited companies. So more than half are, are actually people just working for themselves. And that's not even really a category that banks recognise as a business, <laughs> generally. Uh, another issue in, in terms of experimentation and risk, I would say, is that um, a sector which is not well served, or sectors, are community enterprises, cooperative businesses, um, you know, uh, social enterprises that are structured as uh, community interest companies, charities that trade. Anything that's not straightforward, limited company or, or, or commercial business also struggles with the existing finance system to access appropriate finance. So these are gaps. And if we want more innovative and community-led initiatives that are in, in terms of ones that are self-financing, so businesses, social enterprises, then I think that's something we need to look at uh, for sure. In terms of um, procurement, I, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in procurement, although I was really pleased to hear about the plug in the leaks reference. So I used to work at the New Economics Foundation for five years. And absolutely, again, with the ethos of the bank, keeping the money you've already got, putting that to better use, is, is an essential part of this strategy. Um, I think might, I'll refer back to my earlier comments on blended finance, really. Um, Plymouth City Council have set up, they did have a social enterprise investment fund, that's now Cooperative uh, Development Enterprise um, Investment Fund. Again, to declare, you know, they have invested in Southwest Mutual, uh, w which is great. But I think that it's a good example of how local authorities can, by themselves, or I, I think in partnership with others, create pools of finance which are able to take more risks, um, blended with, uh, with other sort of sources of finance. 
uh, to make sure that we can. Um, I mean, it's a really well-made point, is that we are, you know, if we're going to take the, the word emergency seriously, then we are going to have to experiment and try things, and there, there will have to be failure if we're taking enough risk. So matching that up with a public sector's natural appetite for zero risk... <laughs> is a problem without doubt. So um, I think, you know, example, setting up an arm's length investment fund like Plymouth have done, for example, um, making sure that there is appropriate finance for new forms of enterprise, again, you know, I think it is important. Um, but uh, it's a cultural point, isn't it? I, th I think the more that we can, um, I think as Jeremy put it, you know, give people permission to fail, I think it's really important. I, I don't know, I I've never been a local council procurement officer, so I don't know what that's like, but I imagine that, um, uh, that you don't have permission to get a contract wrong. Uh, I don't know how we change the culture around that because we do need to, to we do need to um, give more contracts to some firms. And oh, I guess my final point on this would be so I have gone on a little bit, but in a context where we have outsourced to massive uh, public limited companies that have dramatically failed in their provision of public services, you could ask uh, the question: Well, is there anything more risky than that actually? And if we give uh, the chance to local community-led and small owner businesses in Devon, I don't think that could even be considered more risky than the current um, contra outsourcing strategy that we've already had. Um, yeah, just a, a few points connected to that. Um, wearing a couple of different hats here. Um, so part of my time I spend running a small um, international collaborative community development charity um, and we recently did a bit of work with the Welcome Centre for Cultures and Environments of Health Exeter University um, and we had a conversation there. We invited in other l small um, local charities um, and sort of community interest groups to talk about some of these things. Um, something that came out was particularly for small charities, and I imagine therefore businesses, but in a slightly different way, is the kind of the hoops that you have to jump through when you're connecting with donors. Um, and in an increasingly complex world where, you know, we're small, but we're doing c quite interesting collaborative work, um, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I'm also doing similar stuff in Devon. But how do you, how do you, train donors um, to kind of come around the complexity um, and rather than make you jump through their hoops you can bring them into your world and sort of show them your complexities and rather than it be in the case of a charity us ticking off donor requirements and, and monitoring to please donors how do we dovetail our needs and create new um, requirements and ways of working so it's not donor-led um, you know, and it's also respecting the, the expertise of some of the donors we work with. And I wonder how that tr translates to this world. Um, how, do we, how do we kind of work with donors and funders and, and finance to, to sort of come into our world a bit and um, find a, a new common ground, um, which then links to kind of conversations and collaboration how are, how are we being honest in these things rather than trying to impress donors or impress whatever investors is there permission to be honest in these conversations and share where we're struggling and ask for help so say okay we've got three of these four whatever requirements or um, areas ticked off we would really love to be mentored by someone perhaps who can help us plug that gap and if we could partner that way then we can deliver something really good um, also kind of creativity in, in delivering services so um, I think it was Lambeth Council that had about £20,000 to spend on um, kind of youth offending services and rather than come up with um, the outcome straight away and look how they were going to deliver it they invited in ex-youth offenders to create um, a solution with them um, and there was a lot of unknown in that process but um, what they ended up delivering was co-created so it's it's how do you, through conversation and collaboration, decrease that risk by being honest and being open about where the challenges are. Um, and lastly, you know, you decrease risk by sharing good practice and not reinventing wheels. So where good things are happening, where pioneering is going on and it's working, what can we learn? There's a great study, um, some of you may be familiar with, um, a case study in Preston, um, looking at um, 
procurement and and how do you how do you redirect the budget of big anchor institutions into the local place and that redirected um, millions of pounds back into Preston and Lancashire more generally but they set up the Preston procurement practitioners group whereby um, officers and practitioners could get together you know does what it says in the tin they could share good ideas share challenges and find ways forward together so I think to if we want to encourage a culture of trial and error which is something again at the charity that we really try and do y you mitigate that by being honest by being open having conversations and not sort of hiding behind pride and ego which i think is definitely a factor here um not here in this group i mean but it can it, it can you know it's yeah it, it, it's it's certainly something i come up against with um so how do we break that down and trust each other I think the example of the Evergreen um, Ohio co-ops and Preston is really, really relevant here. Um, the Public Services Act, which in 2012, which imposes a legal duty on the council to ensure where the council is carrying out procurement to consider how what is um, proposed might improve the economic, social, and environmental well-being of the relevant area, has, has you know, it's been in force for a while. It's really interesting that that came up. Um, in your discussions. So we've had it since 2012. In Cornwall we've got, you know, had a brilliant example um, with the work they did at Cornwall County Council Hospital of um, local pro procurement in food. So we know what all the answers are and, and to me I sort of feel actually quite frustrated about this because it's it, it keeps coming up, but so why hasn't it happened already? Why is it something that's still being mentioned? Why have we had the answers before? And actually that, that failed, I think, largely because it was a crippled by its PFI contract. Um, so how, how can we just not have a, you know, repeat a talking shop about the same issues and actually get to the, get to the, the, the meat of, of experiment? Um, at Dartington, we've been, uh, we were talking to a company called Natura, who are based in London, and they um, uh, service about, um, they have about 1,200 chefs who they supply to, about 800 in London. And actually what they've been really successful at doing in terms of procurement is deliberately, consciously working with small growers. So they work with small growers in Cornwall um, and in Devon, and I think it, it, we were at a re, um, regenerative agriculture weekend at Baconic a couple of weeks ago, and where there was the whole supply chain, but maybe we need to start calling them supply networks, the whole network in the room. So I think some of this sort of creating the conditions for experiment, permission to fail, is, is about um, funding those small experiments and where you do get the whole um, supply network in the room, but you also understand that the the growers who are now having, um, the amazing growers who are now having value added to their produce and making a more viable living um, on, on you know, their, their small acreage um, by supplying a business that supplies London chefs were struggling to make a living um, just doing a community supported agriculture box scheme that su supplied local um, homes. So one of the challenges we also have is that we haven't been paying enough for food and that's a, that's a procurement issue as well. I think, Harry, you mentioned several kinds of risks, um, uh, and several were referred to in our previous conversation. So I think they're different. The community risk of seeming foolish is, is one kind of risk and is helped by peer support groups such as have happened among parish councils where they've all been talking to each other and saying, how do we respond to this locally? Um, there's the planning risk, which is not mitigated um, in that way because it's in the system and in the NPPF and the dangers of appeal and being overturned and bearing the costs of it needs a system approach to that. Um, the risks in procurement, I, I think your question puts it on, on, hits it on the head. Why is this not happening when there are answers? And I know one anxiety has been about um, falling foul of European legislation among procurers. Uh, that they feel they're not allowed to prefer local people, but putting in place a suitable social value framework before the whole procurement process starts does mitigate that risk, and I don't think people know about it enough. So there's a knowledge element. 
Just, just while we're on that subject then, it would just be good to pick up um, a few of the points made. Um, so I think some of the hurdles with the procurement, one, one is the financial thresholds that are set by local authorities in terms of organisations being of a sufficient size to actually even get through the initial stage and get through to the tender stage. And I think the other challenge is quite often when looking at finance, social, environmental, very often local authorities have a price quality split. So immediately on the financial side, you've got a massive proportion devoted to that. So 40, 50, 60 percent, sometimes 70 percent is on price. And then you have to do all the other criteria. The other, the remaining proportion then is split across other criteria. And that's not just going to be social and environmental, it's going to be technical delivery, planning, lots of factors play into that. So by the time you get down to your social and your environmental criteria, you're looking at relatively small proportions in the overall picture, which I think is one of the key barriers to why it's not having an impact. The other issue, of course, is affordability. So quite often councils, local authorities have aspirations to be more sustainable, more environmental, but the cost associated with that, they've gone out, they've procured, they come back and they say, all right, well, we can't afford that. Um, so I don't know what the views are amongst you all about how that might be addressed um, for, for local authorities going forward. Well, I, I, the final point I, I can't answer about the terrible funding environment the local councils have found themselves in. Well, haven't found themselves in, have been put in um, uh, by government policy over uh, since 2010. However, on, on the earlier points about assessing the quality of a bid, uh, it's interesting because um, that focus on price. As an economist, and when I, I, I'm a visiting lecturer at, um, at Schumacher College, I often start off by uh, reminding people that market prices are always wrong. In every single instance, market prices are wrong. Why do I say that? Because they cannot take account of the full social and environmental costs and benefits that that market transaction will create. It is never reflected in the price. Okay, So there is, there is this sort of ideology that we've been subjected to that market prices are always right. <laughs> it's actually 100% the opposite. Now, why is that relevant to a council? Of course, because those hidden costs often land up on the council's door step. Um, they have to pay for them over the long term. So that, that, there's a timing problem there in that, you know, getting this right, you know, having procuring healthier food to, in hospitals, uh, well, I know it's not necessarily the council that does that, but schools, um, it will have obvious health benefits. It will filter through eventually through public services in terms of costs, but there is a time lag. So that invest to save issue, it's a sort of well-known strategy, but it's quite difficult to evidence. I, I get that. But I think it's sort of changing the basic frame of understanding we have, I think, would be a good place to start. And, and a useful go-to, sort of, I quoted Mark Carney. I'm now going to quote uh, Lord Stern, you know, uh, LSE economics professor who led the review into climate change. He said, climate change is the greatest market failure the world has ever seen. Okay, so if this doesn't give us permission to have a broader understanding of what value means in procurement, I don't know what does. I'm, I'm going to have to go very shortly. I just something I wanted to say, sort of slightly going back to um, what I said before about communities and, and people owning the issue. Um, I think there is, a, we tend to talk about organisations like local councils, that they are actually you know, they are the community PLC, aren't they? They are the community. It's not, and it's not money that is come from somewhere else. It's money that's come from the community. And we, I think we need a more honest conversation with people. So having said that, we don't, I don't think we, significant, we acknowledge poverty in this process sufficiently. I also think we don't acknowledge the fact that actually if we want a better society and we want um, to uh, address climate change properly and we want to make sure our services are funded properly, then, then somebody needs to pay for it. So we shouldn't be trying to keep get uh, more for less. We should be saying, embracing the fact and explaining to people why their council tax needs to go up or why we need to raise precepts from parish councils because there are good things that can be done for those that can afford to pay. And 
you know, even though there is extensive poverty in places like rural Devon and in all over Devon, there all is also considerable wealth and we ought to be trying to harness that in providing better services. Um, I'm sort of stepping away from finance for a bit, actually, and probably coming back to, um, I suppose, more spatial planning. Um, Michael made a point earlier in the discussion um, that MPPF doesn't encourage sustainable development. Um, I think as a, as a transport planner, I certainly see that from the, the point of view there's a line in there that says, unless impacts are severe, then you cannot object to it, which is, which is clearly not in terms of the policy context that we should be following. Um, I think we've we've discussed the risk that a lot of officers feel they can't object to developments, however, no matter the, the current policy environment that we're in, because there's the risk of appeal and, and the policy is set nationally. Um, so I've got a question, uh, just open to, to everyone, in terms of how can we give officers and the local authority the rights and the sort of, I guess, the ability to, to reject developments based on the fact that we are now in an emergency and recognising we're in an emergency, um, and how do we mitigate against that challenge of appeal? I don't know if anyone wants to take that one on. Go on then. There is a cultural aspect, I think, for planning officers as well as the legislation, legislation they're working to. I just should introduce another issue which I didn't reflect on first of all, uh, in terms of the number of developments that are coming forward where the applicants are saying it's not viable, therefore we can't afford to pay you these community goods, whether that be green infrastructure, classically affordable housing, um, so they'll seek a reduction in the percentage of affordable housing which gets provided on, on site. Um, and these are really quite significant developments on, on greenfield sites. There's a whole issue around land values and the cost at which the promoter developer bought the land in the first case. And we were in a, still in a cycle where a lot of land was purchased at quite high cost. So th if you then bring in the uh, environmental goods that we would wish to see, we're already in a situation where we're struggling to get those community benefits and mitigation of the negative impacts of, of developments through because of this uh, issue about viability. Um, I, I, a lot of the uh, uh, planning, w w as we have the MPPF, is 50 pages or, or so, uh, which was a summary uh, of many thousands of pages that we had previously. It doesn't cover all the bases, so there is flexibility within the planning guidance that we have, because if, if you don't have a current local plan, if you don't have a five-year land supply, you fall back on this 50 or so pages uh, that is the MPBF for guidance. So I, I think there is the flexibility now to push the agenda. However, it, it is a quasi-judicial process. Um, or it, it can get to that point. Local authorities are under potential challenge in terms of following due process through ju the judicial review uh, procedures, which is another anti-risk um, threat that hangs over the head of, uh, of any public sector organisation. Uh, there is something about the precedence that's set by, should we be very even bold, and it goes to appeal, then inspectors actually being guided in their judgments to recognise some of what we've been discussing here, because as in judicial cases, precedent is quite significant in terms of its impact upon future decision making. We do refer a lot in planning to, well, there was a similar case along the road and the outcome was this. So as planning officers, that informs our decision making and that the, the same counts uh, at the planning inspector level, where if we do start making demands. Now, there is I think quite a, a flexibility in planning policy as well. Some authorities, Reading Borough Council and others, there's a number of them who have introduced policies to reflect environmental uh, gains that need to be uh, built into developments, right? not just carrying on the same old as we have. But 
because of the lack of prescription or clarity, perhaps, in planning legislation, it's down to individual local authorities to pursue a particular line, have the commitment to it and take the risk. There isn't that clear guidance currently, so I, I think having those exemplars is gaining some traction now and people are looking at those authorities and seeing, well, you need to be producing a percentage of your energy demands on site. We're still working around net biodiversity gain and what that means. And in North Devon, we're producing a, a, a document to, with uh, Natural England to explain what that uh, outcomes would be achieved. So there is opportunity. The framework is quite broad, it, going back to this risk argument, but also just having the time, and that's been mentioned, around resources to lift your head above the everyday and think, well, what actually are we trying to achieve? What are the outcomes that we're trying to achieve for all this community rather than what does this individual application, is it, it's not bad enough that I can refuse it, but it's not really as good as it could be. So it's rather a rambling response, but... Uh, I suspect I may be saying the same thing, but in a rather different way. I think the very fact that you find yourself as a planner, albeit a transport planner, compelled to ask the question in the form, how can we empower officers to more easily reject things, probably pretty much defines the absolute nadir point that the planning system has reached. Because the question that you should have been asking and probably wanted to ask is how can the planning system encourage the right development and encourage development that will help communities to be more sustainable rather than feeling that you've just got to find a way of rejecting everything that comes before you. And it seems to me that that absolutely defines the situation that we are in with the planning system not being able to be proactive in helping to solve this 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 very problem and maybe one you know if you were to be asking the right question perhaps one component part of the answer is to devolve away from the NPPF to going try to going back to more regionalized planning um, in a more constructive and positive way but the one thing I would put on that is I think we are in real danger at the moment that if we do return to any kind of regionalised planning framework, there's a real danger that it will be driven by the core cities. And the one thing we have to be really certain of is that rural areas from a, at a governance level are properly involved in that, in defining what the objectives of any kind of regionalised going forward of the planning system becomes. We can't have something which is driven entirely by the needs of a small number of core cities. Sorry, I was just going to say that I think that we have changed the planning system into one that is a tick box exercise. You know, it sounds fantastic having front loaded a front loaded planning system, but we're expecting an awful lot from planning officers um, working in the system who don't necessarily have a broader understanding. It, it's quite, it can be quite narrow what you consider, and you, you don't have that bigger picture. People we don't work collaboratively enough. Um, we're, t as planners, we're supposed to be about facilitating good development. We're not supposed to be about creating barriers for, 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 or, or just defaulting to, you know, what's least bad. Um, and and that, that's something that we probably can't do in this room, but something about expertise and experience and encouraging creative thinking and planning, you know. Planning is an art, not a science, as I always say. Um, and so we need that creative thinking. And we also need to be having a much, although you know, time is of the essence and all that, but we need to bring back the Community Land Act, Tax Act. Um, <laughs> we need to look at not this, starting from a point, I've worked with developers you know, many times on, both, on all sides of the fence, really. You know, this, they come, they bought a piece of land, they come from a place where they consider 100% of that land is developable. And we need to be informing that process so that you know, we have policies in place and we have, um, you know, our, our, our spatial planners have looked at it and said, well, no, actually, you know, this is not 100%. And we need to be a bit more relaxed. This m might be a heinous thing to say. We need to be a bit more relaxed about how much land we allow development to have so that we have real quality in our development because we have the wor worst of all words at the moment. You know, we aren't 
concreting over our countryside, but we are creating awful places for people to live, which you know are just places where people have to always get in a car and go somewhere. That's me, I'm going for something. <laughs> Before you go, Deborah, can I just say, what tax did you mention? Community land tax. As in land value tax? Yes. Thank you. Oh, okay. um, I, I just wanted to make a, a comment um, drawing on uh, my previous work at the RSA on, on deliberative democracy. And I, I just wondered whether there was a, a point early on made about how can we have a, a quicker response than, than through neighbourhood planning processes, uh, given the state of the emergency. But, but still, then for me, the question is, how does it have democratic legitimacy? And I wonder whether, you know, I'm sure many of you will be familiar of the, the ladder or the spectrum of participation, and there are various points on that. Um, I think, um, you know, at the RSA, we certainly saw that good processes um, could work very well with citizens who were um, able to um, tra grapple with complex trade-offs with the right information and support and input from experts, but when they're in, in control. And a citizen's jury methodology, which needs a relatively fewer number of people, um, considering sort of uh, quite tightly scoped questions, but, uh, but which they're able to consider all the complex sort of linkages around that particular question, it's something that can happen quite quickly, and I wonder whether planning processes, uh, or, or indeed, or indeed, perhaps even procurement policies, are ones where you could fairly rapidly deploy uh, a citizens' jury type methodology. Where and, and our experience was that when you put people in that, that situation, they are able to exercise their citizen self rather than their consumer self, and think more broadly about the benefits of the community and get outside their own individual point of view that would give democratic legitimacy um, to then what officers and indeed councillors um, might need to go and implement in the face perhaps of pressures from interests with you know, lots of money at stake that are pushing the other way. I'm going to try and sum up the spatial stuff, so please get the rest. There's just a couple of, I think, connected points. Um, one is, and again, with my hat as a councillor in Mid-Devon, which is rural, there's also a high proportion of um, homes and buildings in conservation areas. Um, and in the spirit of kind of protecting what we have as well as thinking of the new, it's where does kind of rules around conservation and listed buildings come into this? Because that's one of the uniquenesses of Devon, I think, is we've got these gorgeous, amazing, ancient homes. Um, how do we bring some of those standards and policies up to date so that it's not down to, um, you know, officers to discern national policy and apply that to very unique cases? Um, how can, you know, can we do some work around energy efficiency of older houses? I think that could be a really helpful thing to look at. Um, and also the role of, so I also sit on the... Um, the member consulting board of guests, which is the Greater Exeter Strategic Plan. Um, and my understanding is that that kind of comes higher up than the local plans and neighbourhood plans in terms of looking at spatial planning and so on. Um, how c in the guest process is kind of moving along at the moment, how can that be an opportunity in these conversations to bring in communities um, and to, to join up some of the dots on transport and housing and um, you know what is our vision with guests where could we get to and how could it enable some of these conversations um, and also going back to the offices and social value and councils um, the social value act was designed to kind of help um, authorities and others think about the economic environmental and social value um, and then to choose and procure based on these things and again, I, yeah, I keep talking about dot joining, but how do we use that as a opportunity within councils and elsewhere to join dots? So when we are choosing and when we are procuring with those things in mind and we know that we're delivering more environmental and social value because of it, how, how does that then have a ripple effect on the rest of our workloads? So where we were maybe spending some money over here to achieve, I don't know, well-being outcomes, how, does our, how do our procurement processes link into that so maybe it's a bit more burden in thinking of procurement but actually it lessens the burden on other council services um, 
and pieces of work and I think that's really interesting and it needs it needs therefore people within an authority to be able to sit and join up different work streams and that's something I'm finding quite interesting at the moment in Mid Devon and lastly um, and this goes so, sort of connects to my role um, with my, my charity it's not just kind of participatory development, but it's, it's going beyond that to what um, Angie was saying earlier, kind of asset based. It's starting with what's strong. You don't just invite communities in to participate in a process. You put them front and center of decision making and subsequent action. And again, my experience, you know, around the world, but also in rural Devon says that when you hand over that trust um, and and leadership to communities they self-manage and they <laughs> good things come and you have to kind of trust that process so therefore you need skilled people around that to facilitate those processes um, so it's not just a tick box participatory development we've done that it's actually community-led and i think that's a thing to think about thanks um i was aware of the time but what i was going to try and do is that this the spatial planning discussion is is right range very broadly and i think um we aren't going to finish it today <laughs> um but i wanted to perhaps reflect on what i've heard and test that understanding with you as and maybe setting up uh, a bit the beginning of our hypothesis on where, where we might go with this um first of all it seems to me that the planning system at the moment is highly emasculated it's 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 small it's very focused on facilitation of certain forms of development and I think it's also stuck on the notion of delivering certain patterns of development which have a perceived or assumed sustainability, um, which is backward looking very much. Um, so, and comments have been made about that, particularly from Germany. Um, where I think we might lift ourselves from this rather weary experience of the planning system being so compromised or so limited in what it can do, maybe through the notion of emergency and that that changes everything to use Naomi Klein's words you know that we have a situation now where rather than getting more of what we've got out of the planning system and and perhaps a broader uh, need to s look at spatial organization of things and particularly the relationship between town and country uh, we need to get something different out of it we need to get different outcomes we have different objectives to serve through those outcomes and it's in those the notion of objectives and outcomes led uh, planning which somebody mentioned i can't remember who it was and i would have liked to have name checked you uh, that we might have uh, a way of looking at this differently which is if we're now saying well w the things we need out of the planning system and it's and it's where it interferes or, or organizes or engineers you know we're social engineers planners it sounds embarrassing to say it but that's the whole system wouldn't exist without the need to be that sort of thing um then we need to now to start thinking very clearly and this is something jeremy said about the relationship with the food system because the food system is the most vulnerable system I under climate change and settlement uh, and there are lots of intricate relations within that but we also need to be asking ourselves questions about the assumptions we've made about settlement and again this has been mentioned about the containment of urban development the building upon all available space within the notion that the rural is sacrosanct because what we might need out of the system in terms of gaining food security and food resilience and the resilience of communities that come with that and of local economies, and I use the plural deliberately, it's often said in the singular, but actually it's nonsense in the singular, it's lots of little things, um, might mean that we need to different spatial choices about where we put development to achieve those outcomes. <coughs> and in that, we may have the platform from which to reconsider the role of spatial planning and not looking for <coughs> assumed patterns and by the way any funding for checking what happened when you put a local plan in place the assumptions you made about reducing travel people working locally we, we have never done research on that for, for at least 15 years and the research i did on it before that time for agencies such as the countryside agency found that the world was way more complex than assumed and a lot of unintended consequences happened and quite a lot of those involved travel mainly by car. So we really do need to kind of step away from all of that and ask ourselves, well, in my view, I'm sorry, I'm sort of, just sort of <laughs> putting this out for response, that if we then really and quickly need to achieve different outcomes from 
spatial decisions we make. And we're quite clear on the headline priorities there, which is reducing carbon emissions, but it's also uh, seeking more opportunity for sequestration, but also we plan for need in the planning system. We don't really plan for opportunity, but we need lots of opportunity now. Uh, maybe it reframes our planning approach and can give us the um, imperative for urgency, which has been talked about, which is not to say we don't carry on with the legacy of some planning decisions because there's inertia in the system. But on top of that, we need to be experimenting and innovating to see what might happen if we do things differently. And if it works, to then mainstream that stuff. So that's my thoughts on the planning system. It's a kind of, it's a sleeping giant in, in many ways. And whilst d difficult to wake up from the local level, not impossible. But I looked to my local authority colleague in Mike and, and also looked to Jeremy with his wider experience to um, how realistic is that? But brackets, we have to do this anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, one of the ongoing mantras about the town planning system has, as we have it from successive governments has been that it's a barrier to what community and business particularly wants to achieve. And uh, so there is a whole mindset that planning is a very negative thing and not something which can be at, at all for good and positive outcomes. Uh, so th th there is something which needs to uh, f fundamentally change. Uh, I agree with you that um, we should be looking at the whole premise of of town planning and decide, identifying what those headline priorities are. Um, I think it, it, at the moment it's in the wrong place, it's not well resourced, it doesn't have that clarity about of purpose about what the system is there to achieve. We talk very broadly about uh, achieving beneficial community outcomes uh, from it's mitigating the negatives from development with community interests, but environment doesn't figure nearly as, uh, as uh, strongly as it needs to do. And it's become disassociated from a lot of else that goes on in, in land use. Uh, it was when we had landscape pioneer work was done on Northern Devon based on the biosphere work. And we had a lot of DEFRA colleagues down who supporting that work and they were looking at land use. I, in the one of the conclusion documents I saw, there was barely if any mention about land use. It's seen, I think, as an urban-based system, which is very much weighted towards that. Uh, that's missing out a huge part of the equation. And as colleagues have said, it doesn't really even take into account rural uh, in, a, in, a, in the way it should do. So it's really a, a town-based urban system, and uh, it's, it's de designed around that premise. Can I just say, I think you summed up brilliantly. I think you have absolutely got it in the way you summed up. I think the, the depressing thing is just how far what you described as where our thinking needs to get to is from where the planning system is at the moment. So I think, but I think what you said was absolutely right. Um, and we would need to get there in the context of not having a countryside agency or a commission for rural communities that might leaven the rather urban-based approach to the planning system that MHCLG tends to take. And in my experience, there is very little <laughs> strong relationship between DEFRA in its rural affairs role as opposed to its environment and agriculture roles and MHCLG over the planning system as it relates to rural areas. So not only is there an enormous gap to be bridged in the way that you, des you described, um, but also there's very little in the way of national institutional frameworks there to enable you to bridge it either and very little political will to put them back. So you kind of you've got a you've got a kind of blockage every step of the way in trying to get to what you what you described, which I, again I say I think was a very good summary. The only the only glimmer of hope I can immediately see on the horizon um, is is perhaps the Kerslake Commission, that if one could persuade the Kerslake Commission and if their 2070 look forward about. Um, uh, trying to bridge the gap regionally between the disparities 
both interregionally and intra-regionally with, within the UK, and if their recommendations get taken seriously when they finally complete their final report next year, then that might give a little bit of leverage to start to address some of the things you've been talking about on top of, layered onto the, the need to deal with, the, with the, the climate change issues. But I think you were spot on in what you said. I don't know if we can still carry on a little bit, but I just, um, yeah, I just was thinking it, it's not going to change the system, but there's a really interesting role for arts and culture to play in in disruption. Um, and I think given that uh, the UN sort of identified that um, water scarcity is going to be a challenge by 2025 uh, and other places that have already um, been dealing with that challenge, uh, there are some really interesting projects in places like Calgary where... Um, artists have been embedded in planning departments and um, what that's led to is is some creates really nice focal points for behavior change at least or public consciousness raising and awareness um, and and some actual you know behavior change and policy change as well I did mean to uh, give a quick uh, reference to the Garden Towns and Garden Communities Initiative and speaking to some Homes England colleagues, they will, they will say this is what planning should look like, but it is unfortunately, it's the exception and it comes with a quite significant amount of, ex of funding from government to enable those local areas to imbue some of those qualities in these new settlements or extensions which capture environmental gains um, that's what planning should be, but as I say, it's on this, the exception basis, but that's how the whole of the planning system could and should be working um, to achieve some of what we've been talking about this morning. Just one, I'll be about 10 seconds, Harry. <laughs> well, perhaps one purchase point is, though, that Devon is really very rural and that we have extra in Plymouth. But other than that, most of how to understand Devon is in terms of rurality. So maybe we do have another purchase point in that we are strategically different in being lots of small things rather than one big thing that relates to a hinterland. Um, so I wanted to sort of steer the conversation more to behaviour change, um, and you were just touching on it a little bit, Angie. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in the, the public realm uh, which is where you were talking about. But firstly, I was going to ask David uh, and anyone else that wants to chip in about um, behaviour change within organisations and um, within cultures. And it's been touched on in terms of planning conversation just now that, um, you know, yes, there are legislative problems, but it's a culture change that needs to happen within people within organisations. Um, I think the same could be said about the risk conversation with finance and, and different areas. So, um, my question is, how would you encourage behaviour change um, within organisations, really? Um, behaviour change within organisations. I guess that feeds into thought I've had coming out of all the conversations we've had so far which is the implicit need to join everything up um, and I guess that's what this process is about and what the plan will do um, but in a way that's an answer in that siloing it in organizations or at one level of the scale is in itself to have already failed I guess um, even if you think about someone who's a planner they might also be a parent with a kid in local school that isn't there anymore their sister might be a seasonal worker. So I, I'm getting at the fact, I guess, that these things need to be a part of people's lives, not just things that happen in the workplace or when they're in an organization. Um, something, and it needs to be something I am doing, not something that just happens to me as well. And I say that as someone who works in academia in these general fields and lives in Devon. Um, so how an organization changes its sense of what it does. Um, a climate emergency was mentioned earlier. I think one extrapolation of that is the idea of mobilization. Um, the fact an emergency means you are on some kind of war footing. 
And it's an uncomfortable thought, but also a war generally involves an enemy. And you don't want to demonize anybody in particular or anything, but there's a sense that there's something to be fought and that you are fighting for something, but also means fighting against something as well. Um, and I think we're often very polite and aspiring to be apolitical in some ways, because that's the easy option, but these are all political struggles. And we just have to take that on the chin, and that's, that's what it is. Um, so I think changing behavior within organizations, I think that sense of being mobilized as a, as a organization towards a greater struggle is one starting point, but also a recognition that it can't just be within organizations. It has to be the plan when it comes has to be something more that's happening elsewhere to enable people to live in a decarbonized Devon. It has to be something that is part of their lives. If I could just say from a, a local authority perspective around cultural change and behavior, local authorities certainly, which is my area of experience, is based on management models which come from a industrialized specialist approach. So we have, we still have, you know, heads of, heads of planning, heads of engineering, heads, whatever, it, whatever it is. So you take on, if you're a highways person, you take on a highways perspective. You're neither trained nor supported to actually take on a more holistic understanding of the impact of what you do, because it's the way in which we organize to make the management task easier within the organization rather than on an outcomes based framework so there does need to be changes in how we understand the leadership role within the organization but outside of the organization as well referring to what was just said i quite like what like what stroud district council have been doing environmental work very well for more than a decade they describe the style of what they do is it's, they lead from just behind the front. So they're supporting and engaging and facilitating and enabling communities to take up those leadership roles with the council there, but it, it, it's not, it doesn't see itself needing to be at the forefront, which is often the case perhaps in political organisations, but just behind supporting and motivating and providing re resource. Can I just... Um Speaking of culture, I'd like to bring in a quote from Star Wars. <laughs> There's a quote in one of the Star Wars films that says something like, this is how we'll win, not by fighting what we hate, but by protecting what we love. And I think that's, uh, I find that really helpful. It's, it's how do we start, you know, we all love something. How do we use that as a starting point rather than we're fighting this intangible thing called climate change which we can't really get our heads around because we've got other concerns uh, i think star wars has a good quote for most things in life so that was today's quote um i also think behavior change is kind of the holy grail of a lot of um work certainly when i got my international development hat on it's much easier to go and plonk a project on a community than to engage in behavior change which is you know who knows whether that will take a year or 10 years or uh, you know, generations. So there's something about how do we know when we've got to an endpoint in behavior change? What is, is it even possible to define that endpoint? Or do we need to accept this is a kind of evolutionary journey? Um, and to that end, there's loads of great resources and books out there. There's one I particularly like called, is a book called Reinventing Organizations um, by, I think, Frederick Leloux. And that talks about, and we use a lot of that in the charity, um, sort of self-management, self-replicating good ideas. So rather than top down, we need to go and make all these good things happen. It's how do we give communities, organizations, individuals, the resources and connections and therefore network to be able to replicate ideas themselves. Um, and also what does leadership look like? What do we need to move towards in leadership? Thank you. Um, if I can just tag on to that, the, the original part I forgot to mention in my question was about uh, collaboration and you sort of touched on it in, in terms of people work in very much uh, their own departments or, or it's not applied to their lives or whatever. So I was just wondering, um, picking up on your imaginative work and that, um, I'm interested in how we would... Um, sort of use those processes to 
actually how you get people thinking together, collaborating together, working together. Um, I'm seeing people looking at watches, so I don't know if we've got time for an answer on that, but uh, yeah, very quickly, just some of that real how on uh, that. Shall I, shall I go first? Yeah, go yeah. Um, again, I definitely coming back to the role of of artists in in answering and arts organisations, and I think um, uh, I I had the opportunity to work quite closely with um, a lady called Bernadette Lynch, who's the author of uh, a report called "Whose Cake Is It Anyway?" that was commissioned by the Hamlin Foundation, and she worked extensively with a group of twelve museums. Um, and there is some, I, I think the arts and culture space is further ahead on this probably than, than other sectors in terms of um, democratising participation and that is what leads to, I, th I believe that's what, that's what leads to behaviour change and we have some great organisations locally that do it. Um, Nina Simon who was at the Santa Cruz Museum of Art and History has been really pioneering in this space and uh, she spoke at this year's National Trust um, Convestival conference and that's available online and anyone can, can view that and I recommend, um, I highly recommend um, anything that Nina Simon writes or, or talks about. Um, and actually that uh, place of, of doing that work has come from, came for her from, from taking on an organisation in Santa Cruz that was pretty much bankrupt. So that's interesting as well um, because actually sometimes the great is easier to take a big risk at the point of absolute failure, <laughs> um, which I think is where we are in terms of, you know, what we've been doing uh, to the land. So in terms of uh, the behaviour change in the public realm, I think we need to be talking about a new land ethic. We need to talk about regional land trusts. Um, we need to create opportunities to to look at land use in radically different ways. Um, the the watershed project that I mentioned in Calgary, uh, which is um, its guiding motive is to embed artists and more specifically their creative processes within the local government's core activities and the Calgary watershed. And the program presents an in innovative approach to public art, art and a distinct way of working with the public and other partners. And it's part of a long-term plan which represents a major step change in taking creative practices further into the day-to-day -day activities of, of, of government and working on methods and processes. So that's a really interesting way of, of inviting change. And I think, um, I'm just struggling to remember remember it, but the civic role of the arts, it's, it's been a recent inquiry and it's this idea of how we can leverage our civic backbone, if you like, which I think over the last 50 years is something that we've we've really lost in this country. Um, I think in the 1950s, something like over 50% of architects were employed to work in the public realm. Um, so there is a, uh, this has sort of happened by stealth, this, this um, idea of land stewardship and how we look after land. And if we put the soil and the water uh, at the center of everything, then perhaps quite easily some other things flow, flow out from there. Just very quickly, um, I think we've had answers throughout the session and it's just a case of going back and picking them out. Certainly artists and, and writers have a, a role to play, but I guess we keep hearing about community engagement and consultation and issues of class as well. I'm bound up with the sense of, of who the arts are for and who climate change is about and who it's concerned with. Um, so how you consult and how you engage with communities as being, as being central to that. But even beyond what is explicitly art or imagination or behavioural change, things like citizens' juries and assemblies are a form of, of telling a different story and engaging differently. So I think there's any number of ways that are concerned with this. And I think a part of it is recognising that these are all the same thing. These are all behavioural change and mechanisms for it. And often it's about scale. I think a lot of what we've been saying splinters along the line of scale top down bottom up the need for both and what is the mechanism and what scale is it at that mediates between those two i mean how big is a community um how big is a how big is an org a group within a community acting for the community those kind of practical questions to which there might not be one answer but recognizing that that's where behavioral change is kind of generated and sustained 
Just very quickly, one of the issues I think with universal services, it's assumed everyone's the same and they get the same, and you know, it's fairness in a way. We talked earlier about place-based approaches, but also communities of interest. Tends, those perspectives don't tend to be recognised by service delivery. Um, and there's a hot, people understand themselves and their lives in terms of places and communities of interest, but that isn't understood or built into public service delivery, as, uh, in, in my experience. Okay, thank you for all that. Um, I think clearly there's a lot more that we could talk around and a lot more options that we'd like to explore. Um, I think probably between the four of us, we've got lots of questions that we would like to probe on a bit more. Um, but I think we're rapidly approaching our, our 12.30 close time and we recognise that um, you're all giving your time for free. Um, so we don't want to keep you much beyond that. Um, we, did, we did say at the beginning that we would like to wrap up with... Uh, asking you each for your final thoughts and, and your top three key actions um, and, and then selecting one priority from those into how we should go forward in developing the carbon plan and decarbonising Devon. Um, I think that's still something we think is worthwhile in order to run around the table to do. Um, so I'll just give you a couple of minutes. Um, I think Emily's kindly volunteering to scribe again just to collect your thoughts um, and then we'll start off um, I think maybe we'll pass the mic around the table in the opposite direction just to mix things up a bit. So if we um, go to Angie first. So, yeah, if you don't have three, that's that's fine. But your, your top priority. Um. Are you okay if we kick off? It's the complexity of the of the system and the and the challenge at scale that is that is giving me a kind of brain freeze about um, top three actions. Having thought about them quite a lot in advance, I think something we haven't touched on is is conflict. We're not going to get into any of these spaces um, without. Um, encountering uh, conflict so I'm really interested in the role of bridging um, in, in conflict and um, inclusivity um, and Elizabeth I think you talked about facilitation and I think there is a you know with the with the um, deliberative democracy processes with with our growing consciousness and awareness of citizenship I think there's a there's a new kind of facilitation that's needed and I you know, I have a personal sort of professional interest in that. That's the thing I feel like I've been moving towards and I think it, it, I'm interested in how that facilitation is in service to bridging difference um, and inclusivity in the processes that allow us or support us to address these huge systemic challenges. Okay, I'm, not, I'm certainly not going to go as far as three. I might just get as far as one if I'm lucky in terms of, of priorities. <clears throat> and I'm going you know, to speaking uh, towards ideas of you know, behavioural change uh, amongst average residents um, across the county, across the country. Um, there is this abiding idea that there is a broadening but still relatively shallow engagement with issues of climate change. Uh, and that people, a lot of people in the country are sort of just about getting by at the moment. It's kind of not a great kind of uh, aura of prosperity or well-being about the country at the present time. So, in order to kind of go with the grain of of, of what I see as those two basic realities, it is that the beha focus of behavioural change incentives need really to be around kind of what. How are they going to benefit people's ordinary lives? You know, how is uh, reduced travel, low carbon mobility, how is dietary change, and all those sorts of things actually going to produce benefits to the individual? Because I, 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 the cynical part of me just doesn't believe that the, the climate argument in and of itself is going to actually get enough traction to generate momentum and sustain momentum over long periods of time. So really need to think about those co-benefits uh, that are, speak very clearly to people's everyday lives. I think I probably have two, which I've probably said several times already, so I'll be quick. Um, 
engage with communities, village communities, and allow them to grow to become more sustainable rather than pushing them down a negative spiral of, of uh, polarisation and, and decay. They will have to be allowed to grow if they're going to become sustainable in the future. Um, and whatever we do, we mustn't allow a programme to tackle climate change to make social injustice and social and economic polarisation worse in rural areas. I think that's probably the, the stronger point than the one I made earlier about pricing. I think we mustn't, whatever we do, make social injustice and polarisation any worse by the means by which we use to, to, to tackle climate change. And I think probably it's more of a kind of an overriding point rather than a, you know, a, a pro one priority action. Um, we've, we've got into this situation because we've been having our free lunch. F fossil fuels, peat, then coal, then oil, then gas, they have given the human race its free lunch, which we should never have had. And now we've got to wean ourselves off it. And that actually means reducing consumption dramatically. Um, there isn't another way around it. And I think we probably just have to be extremely honest with ourselves that that is the case. Otherwise, we will be using lots and lots of jargon, lovely words like decarbonise, just to mask over the reality of what actually the human race has got to do over the next 50 years. Um, I don't think I have a key action, let alone three either. In a way, it feels counterintuitive, given we've talked about how holistic the whole, whole thing is, but um, I recognise it's a useful exercise. I think to complement the idea of keeping benefits for the individual at the forefront, the need to sustain a recognition, a belief, uh, a sense that, that those individual benefits scale up to a meaningful level of impact, that they're not token, and that they are maintained. Um, and so any individual ben benefits that accrue to me have a wider and larger meaning and impact, um, and are making a difference. And I wonder, as a final thought, really, um, what our, what Devon's identity is in that sense. Uh, we haven't really talked about that, but you know, some places like, say, Yorkshire or London or Wales, Scotland, there's a clear identity there. But this is a Devon plan. So, is there a sense that as Devon as a county can have that identity, and that can hold together the effort and also provide a level of scale where you see the impact? And you see the level it's working at. Um, yeah. Um, so being very pragmatic about it, I've certainly taken away a lot from this meeting that I'll look at how I can uh, input through the various things that North Devon Council uh, uh, deliver um, with my colleagues. And uh, particularly in planning, but other systems that we are responsible for. Key for me is around the understanding and we talked about participation, um, rural communities, which are a real feature of, of Devon, um, and a, a different way of working with communities, which I think is already an emphasis that we've been taking on board in terms of our work. Public sector tends to be, has been for decades rather paternalistic. Um, more or less in different authorities, but we need to understand, as colleagues have been saying, about the assets that communities have and engage them with them using arts and other approaches. Um, and it's not the responsibility of a team, as used to be the case in my organisation, to go away and do that. It's got to be mainstream. It's how we should be working with our communities in a completely different way. As, as the, the big thing for me, my single one, is, is challenging the whole system with the perspective that we've been talking about this morning. You can pick on bits and pieces of it, but it's taking some of what we've discussed and challenging the whole of what we do uh, and putting it through that sieve of climate change environment. Thank you. There's a few things and three things, and hopefully one each kind of leads on to the next. I think the first thing is, goes back to that language piece. So. Um, what is the role of the local media in this, the local storytelling? How do we make local news um, driving our kind of national and, and local identity in storytelling rather than kind of 
laughing it off as just covering you know dog poo and potholes how do we say actually local media is leading on this how, how can they help us rethink language um, and share stories because that's going to be crucial in um, in this whole journey we need to see examples of other people doing good things to know it's possible local media really has a role there and local storytelling more generally um, when you've got that going, then how do you, how do you, yeah, going back to what others have said, work with communities, um, explore and get really honest about what good collaboration looks like, even when it's messy, like lean into the messiness, because um, it does get messy going back to, I think you were talking about, um, you will encounter conflict. It's okay. Um, it's then how do you push through that conflict? I think Einstein talks about needing to go through complexity to get to simplicity. And I really believe that. And I think the kind of coal face of that is at the community and where you bring together suddenly, you know, people with very different visions and needs. You've got to sit with that. And therefore you need people that have the skill to sit with that and move it forward. Um, you know, uh, so yeah, community moves into um, local politics in the same way we need more power and um, affirmation of local media and the role of that. We need more affirmation and therefore it powers for local government. I think local media and local government kind of go hand in hand on this journey. How do we, how do we decide what we want to lobby for? Where, where do we need more powers, whether it's planning, more money, whatever it is. Um, how are we bringing back some of that power and using it where we are, um, which then links to our identity, you know, so we're leading um, and not just being beholden to or victims of. Um, and then lastly, um, kind of linked to that, the specific procurement thing, I think that's a real opportunity there to join dots and it goes back again to what will be the role of networks in all of this. Um, how do we support and join up local suppliers and businesses to give them the tools they need to really like come into the story and, su and supply institutions and authorities? How do we join up the institutions and authorities so they can share good practice um, and share what works? Um, and again, identifying the opportunities to lobby and to innovate in that procurement piece and, and changing the language around it as well. And I think all of those things connect, but um, yeah, thanks. It's interesting you mentioned conflict and power and I was just thinking who's not at the table and we don't have um, representatives of national scale vested interests here and we do need to have some engagement there and we don't have of course the vulnerable people who don't have a voice, young people, um, even, even elderly who are not very mobile and so on. So how to en engage communities involves those people. And some people don't live in communities. They're commuters and they don't engage. I was wondering how to engage in my par parish, particularly as you were saying, when people are apathetic, stressed, exhausted, and we can't even get to the, to the starting point to have a conversation. Uh, suggestions. Well... Uh, oh yes, just one comment on your thing that we're going to have to consume less. It's great to have that on the table in the conversation. Thank you for putting it there and as, as a basis. Often, 70% of something is consumed by 15% of the people. Like, f that's not just flying, that's all sorts of things. How do we face the justice angle? So, I think I'd like to sharpen up what I said right in the beginning about investment criteria. That impact on... Um, greenhouse emissions and social uh, values needs to come higher than GDP or economic benefits, GVA, in decisions. Um, and so we need to make the conversation that's not happening here happen. Secondly, Devon County Council could invest more substantially than it's planning to in the Southwest Mutual in order to assist availability of investment and blended funds for uh, promoting sustainability at community and business level. Thirdly, um, I'm just wrestling with the idea 
that um, land use conversation recommended a notional price for carbon to inform decisions about land use, carbon sequestration and stuff, carbon price, with, on the other hand, this guardedness about the way price can disadvantage people who are in a vulnerable situation anyway. Um, yeah. Um, as we're moving to the chairs, uh, I will take the opportunity to thank you for your time and, and your ideas and your thoughts and your knowledge because the great value of this sort of uh, meeting is, is the unexpected way in which that all comes together around a, a quite a challenging theme of, of the job we're trying to do. Uh, I, I had a light bulb moment, thank you David, it came from you, which is that we need to remember not to write a technocratic carbon plan. We almost need to write a carbon plan that speaks to every individual household community in Devon in order that it will mean something and, and go somewhere. It needs to have the technical underpinnings that it is sound and, and would work. But um, I think it also needs to be honest. That was another strong theme of today was honesty around the changes coming, come what may, and it's likely to be very challenging. And that things like local authorities exist to try and make the best of what might come from that change. And therefore there's a narrative to develop, I, I suggest, about what a good life for an individual, a household, a community might look like under this change. And, and to seek differentiation <coughs> about the different parts of Devon and how that might be different. So that for me has been a um, really enjoyable to, uh, conversation to be part <coughs> of today, to, to broaden us beyond, I mean, I'm, I'm a technocrat, that's, that's, that's the trouble I have. But to realise that that is certainly not enough for this uh, Devon Carbon Plan to be technically sound, it actually needs to, to reach to many different sorts of people and organisations. Uh, I just say thank you as well. I don't have much more to add other than um, a lot to digest, I think. Um, and thank you for coming along. So. Uh, also, I'd like to say my thanks. I think it's been a really engaging discussion, um, certainly as someone who's not necessarily involved with some of the procurement and finance initiatives. It's been really interesting to hear that. So thank you very much. It's, it's a lot to take away and to think through. Um, I think the key action that I'm taking away is, is actually related to what James has just said in actually painting a vision as to how the future will be better for all the citizens of Devon. Okay, once we get that, you then go beyond and see the citizens of the, the UK and the world. Um, we recognise we're in a global situation, but it's, it's painting that vision of what the future should look like, how we want to act in the future, and that's taking the, the, the social values aspects of as well. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to think about there, but thank you very much. Thank you. Shall I just wrap up? Yeah. I'd like to say thank you all very much too. Um, I've got a huge amount out of this session. Uh, and I think for me also, uh, that sort of reminder about how we frame this carbon plan is really, really vital. And that it speaks to people. And uh, like James, I, I am one that's very focused on the detail uh, and the evidence and the data. But we're, we're that strategic message has to come across very, very strongly. Uh, and also, you know, the values that we hold as a society need to change for that to happen in terms of valuing environmental and social values as well as financial values. And that's going to be a huge societal change to do that. Um, so thank you very much. Just in terms of next steps, so the evidence building doesn't stop here. It's continuing and will continue for some time ahead. So if off the back of the discussions today, A, it may be we've got a meeting this afternoon and, and several more in the diary, we may want to expand further with some of you and be very pleased if you'd be happy to do that. Um, in, in further discussions, as we said, it's a very short time really to, to have these discussions. And please encourage others um, that you know within your networks to submit evidence. The, the call for evidence is still open online, so um, please do that and everything that comes in will, will be looked at uh, and assessed as part of this process. Um, but yeah, just to finalise, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. Could I add one more point in terms of painting the vision? Um, uh, 
we are also um, on social media, um, so help us to paint that vision and to spread that vision by um, using those social media handles and tagging us in on things that you think exemplify the vision of the future. Um, and then we can sort of generate a conversation that's bigger than this room. Thanks.